Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is give an overview of the river, give a little bit of background uh, for people that aren't as experienced and haven't been to as many of these meetings, explain um, some characteristics of the river and, and where we're going to be looking at um, certain areas later tonight. We'll also be talking about the process and the corrective measure study and how this document was put together. Then we'll go to three main categories in the document, uh, an evaluation of sediment alternatives, floodplain alternatives. Uh, the fourth category would be treatment and disposal. So what, would, what are our options and evaluation of options for material that would be removed from the sediment or from the river or the floodplain? What would we do with it? And finally, we'll wrap it up with some uh, summary. Okay, in terms of setting the stage here a little bit, um, I think probably most people from this area remember this, but um, GE negotiated a comprehensive settlement with EPA, the state of Massachusetts, the state of Connecticut, and a number of other government agencies in the late 1990s. That document called the Consent Decree, which we'll refer to during this uh, presentation in certain key parts, um, was entered by the judge in the fall of 2000. It covered many areas which people from the CCC are familiar with. The GE facility, certain Oxbow areas near the river, Allendale School, and Silver Lake to give some examples of areas where GE is investigating and remediating those areas uh, consistent with what's known as performance standards or cleanup standards set out in the consent decree. In terms of the Housatonic, what the consent decree did essentially was uh, broke it up into three sections. The first half mile reach, which is adjacent to the GE facility, was remediated by GE between the fall of 1999 and the fall of 2002. So it was about a three year project. EPA then began the remediation of the mile and a half reach. Uh, and that project went on until the active remediation, I think, until 2006 with some follow up activities into 2007. So about a four year, four to five year remedial project for the mile and a half. So where the East Branch and the West Branch come together in Pittsfield near Fred Garner Park um, is beginning of what's called Rest of River. And in the Rest of River, what the CD does is lays out a process by which um, a, a decision will be reached by, the, by EPA in, in the end. And we'll go through what that process is. The first thing I want to do is just give a map to make sure um, or refresh everyone's memory about where we're talking about here. Um, the Housatonic River watershed. I need my, can you grab my pointer on my bag? Housatonic River watershed is in the western part. Thank you. Western part of Massachusetts, as you see up here, flows down through the western part of the state, through the state of Connecticut, before discharging to Long Island Sound. Uh, we've enlarged uh, the key part here near the GE facility on the east branch of the river. And what you see in the green is the GE facility, about a 250 acre um, facility. Uh, subject to the consent decree activities. Silver Lake on the western side of the facility, adjacent to that, that discharges to the river through a, a culvert. And highlighted here between this point and this point is the half mile reach that I referred to that GE remediated in the late, beginning in the late 1999 into 2002. And then the mile and a half begins at the same, at the Lyman Street Bridge, continues down to the confluence of the East Branch and the West Branch, which is shown there on the bottom. And, and that's work that's been complete, as I, ref as I already had said, but I just wanted to show you where that is on the map and what, what's been done historically. No, that's okay. This is a figure of the watershed, same watershed that I showed you on the photograph on the last, on the last map. Hang on a sec. Uh, same watershed area. What this map shows is a number of reaches that were set out in some of EPA's um, investigation documents. Reach 5 is beginning of the rest of river at the confluence of the east and west branches. There's then a number of reaches down through um, near the end of the river, near the Derby Dam in Connecticut at the end of Reach 16. Um, several key places is Reach 5 and Reach 6, which will have now blown up here on the right hand side. Reach 5 is broken up into three main areas, 5A down to about the Pittsfield wastewater treatment plant or sewage treatment plant, 5B um, up where Roaring Brook comes in below New Lenox Road, 5C down to the headwaters of Wood, Woods Pond, Reach 6 is Woods Pond itself, and a number of these backwater areas which we'll talk about in different ways that are connected to the river channel, sort of small impounded areas, those are called Reach 5D. 
and we'll be using the, or be evaluating those in our in the presentation tonight. Once you go below Woods Pond, um, Reach Seven is the area between Woods Pond Dam and the beginning of Rising Pond, with about a distance of about 18 miles, followed by Rising Pond itself, which is about a 40-acre impoundment, also known as Reach Eight, um, and then reaches Nine, continues down through 16. As I mentioned, uh, the consent decree laid out a process by which EPA will be making a decision about what should be done in the rest of the river. And this is a, a summary flow chart of that process. What it shows is certain activities in blue were activities that EPA agreed to do under the consent decree. Areas or uh, boxes that are in sort of this yellowish color are areas or, or tasks that GE agreed to do. And then the public, uh, is shown in gray, is is also shown on here as well. And in the summary way, what people, EPA did additional data collection, intensive data collection in the late 1990s to supplement data that EP, or GE had collected in the 80s and 90s. EPA then conducted both an ecological risk assessment in a hum, which looks at risks and potential risks to ecological receptors, things like fish, um, certain animals, or um, certain animals or insects and bugs that live in the river. They also conducted a human health risk assessment that's looking at potential risks to humans from both direct contact, which is, um, as you might expect, touching the sediment, touching the floodplain soil, eating things like fish from the river or caught from the river, or um, eating agricultural products that have been grown in certain parts of the floodplain. So it looked at a bunch of, or looked at a variety of potential risks from those types of pathways. Uh, GE did what's called an RFI report, which was done, I think, in 2003, which looked at all the data from the river and compiled it into one report and did some analyses of the data um, that was submitted several years ago. EPA conducted a modeling study, which was, we'll talk about in a little more detail, but it's con uh, developing a fate and transport model, a, basically a computer simulation model that can be used to evaluate remedial alternatives in the river. Uh, we'll go into that in some more detail. GE did another document, another task called Developing Interim Media Protection Goals, or IMPGs, and I've got a couple of charts that elaborate on that. And that, in that process, once those things were done, that got to the Corrective Measure Study, which is the point of the presentation tonight. As I mentioned, uh, GE developed a set of what's called Interim Media Protection Goals, or IMPGs. These are developed based on EPA's risk assessments. So they took into account EPA's exposure assumptions, both for human health and for the ecological um, endpoints they looked at, e the toxicity values that they thought were appropriate, how they, they interpreted the data, et cetera. So they're really directly based on EPA's documents. They back calculate um, some numbers, which I'll show you in a minute, and work on explaining that. And that document was approved by EPA just about two years ago in April of 2006. This is an example chart of some human health IMPGs. There's literally dozens of numbers, probably hundreds of numbers, that we evaluate in the CMS to see how well different potential or media alternatives meet or don't meet these IMPGs that are based on EPA's risk assessments. And I don't want to really belabor this too much. Um, here's a couple of examples, though, for direct contact in the floodplain. Let's pick an example of high use, general recreational use. Um, EPA in the risk assessment has both a cancer risk and a non-cancer risk that are shown. The cancer risk is calculated at a couple of different levels. The low end of the or the high end of the range is one excess cancer in 10,000 people, and the, the lower end of the range or the more conservative end of the range, which is also called 10 to the minus sixth, which we'll use some of these this, um, some of these terms later in the presentation, is based on one excess cancer in one million people. So therefore, you see a two order of magnitude difference. You know, 1.3 for 10 to the minus six, 13 would be 10 to the minus fifth, 134 would be 10 to the minus fourth. Those are different levels of protectiveness. There's different levels in the IMPGs that are associated with that. There's also one non-cancer number, and that tends to serve as the upper end of a range because you need to meet in our evaluations both an, a non-cancer -can cleanup or IMPG and a non-cancer, so we'll use those terms. Um, you see that in floodplain soil, whether some amount of contact or potential contact, 
you could say the numbers are relatively high or the range is relatively wide. If you're looking at something like fish consumption from the river, giving the, given the assumptions in the risk assessment of 50 meals a year from the Housatonic over a fairly lengthy amount of time, the concentrations are very low. These are in milligrams per kilogram, which is also a way to, way to say parts per million um, for people that are familiar with those units. So these are, we're looking at levels well below one part per million in the fish tissue itself, in a fillet, for example, compared to levels that are in the soil. The only other thing I wanted to say is it looked at, the risk assessment also looked at two kind of classes or categories of exposure. One's called reasonable, maximally exposed person, which is a high intensity um, or high consumption rate type person. And a second is more of an average exposure called CTE or um, central tendency exposure. Thank you. And you see since there's less intense use or the assumptions are less intense use, or less intense consumption of fish, the concentrations are higher because there's less um, potential exposure in those examples. So these are some key uh, points on IMPGs that we'll be using to compare the success or lack of success in different remedial alternatives in meeting these levels. As I also mentioned, EPA did a, or developed an ecological risk assessment, and so there's a whole, there's a less, this is actually, these are a complete set of the ecological IMPGs that came out of the risk assessment. Um, and were developed by GE for their approval. It looks at things like benthic invertebrates, uh, certain bugs and, and animals that live in the sediment, uh, things like amphibians, protection of the fish themselves, the actual f health of the fish as opposed to someone eating the fish, um, fish eating birds, insect eating birds, fish eating mammals, a number of examples including threatened and endangered species represented by the bald eagle. Also, you see is the number of, depending on the, the, the receptor group, it, they have different areas of potential exposure. Some are exposed to a sediment concentration, for example, 3 to 10 ppm for benthic invertebrates and sediment. Others, such as uh, fish-eating birds, is a 3.2 ppm concentration in the fish themselves and whole body fish concentration. So different types of uh, endpoints depending on the, the animal that we're looking at. Some have a small range or a range in concentration that were found to be protective in the IMPG evaluation. Others have a single value. And these are some of the key, these are some of the values we'll be using to evaluate the remedial alternatives. Okay, as I mentioned, I'm kind of circling back a little bit to talk about EPA's fate and transport model. Um, some people, I'm sure, from this, this room went to some of the peer review meetings that were held uh, several years ago to during the development of the model at certain phases. Uh, the end result of that was the, a fate and transport model that simulates rest of river beginning at the confluence of the east and west branches, the beginning of rest of river, down as far as reach as rising pond dam. So it reaches five to reach eight. It's actually composed of three individual models, a watershed model, a model that simulates processes in the river itself, including tributary flows, solids flows, how things, how erosion occurs, how deposition occurs in the river, how it occurs onto the floodplain, for example, as well. Very detailed. And the third part of the model is a food chain model, which takes those inputs and um, essentially models them up into the food chain, into fish concentrations that, in li that would live in different areas of the river. So it actually produces a fish concentration over time. And after EPA completed development of the model, they gave it to GE, or gave it to us for our use in using, in developing the corrective measure study uh, with the purpose of evaluating the different sediment remedial alternatives using EPA's model. Each, each run is for a minimum of a 52-year simulation, or in some cases, it's 30 years after completion of remediation, so it's out to about 81 years, and we'll go into that in some more detail. But what the model allows us to do is simulate the time to conduct the cleanup, um, certain activities are more intensive, maybe because of more volume removal or some other reason. It might take longer to conduct certain activities. Those are simulated in the model, the time frame. Residual sediment concentrations that you might expect through dredging or dry excavation or other um, capping techniques. Resuspension rates that might occur through con conduct of various remedial activities in the river. And as I mentioned, there's other inputs such as low-level atmospheric deposition of PCBs into the watershed, and that's, those are things that are factored into the model as well. What the model produces is both water, or three things really, water, sediment, and fish PCB levels over time for each of the alternatives. So, and we'll show you some curves of uh, some of those key parameters and show you what those look like. 
And uh, as I mentioned, the model, EPA's model stops at Rising Pond. We did want to have some ability to do some predictions and extrapolations of data down into Connecticut, into the four major Connecticut impoundments. And so GE developed um, a tool called the Connecticut One-Dimensional Analysis that we used to uh, simulate fish concentrations in those impoundments. And we'll go through some of that data as well. Okay, as I mentioned, um, since we're going to be simulating remedial alternatives in the model to see how well they work and how the water, fish, and sediment levels respond to different activities, we needed to make some assumptions about how the work might be conducted. And we're going to get to the alternatives in a minute. But what we decided in terms of a conceptual approach to evaluate in the CMS was to assume mechanical removal in the dry, similar to what GE did in the half mile and EPA did in the mile and a half for reaches 5A and 5B, which if you think back to the first map, is about the first seven miles of Rester River. The, the channel is relatively narrow. The, the water is relatively shallow. There are some probably some areas of difficult access, but it's area, a technique that we think would be appropriate. Um, in other areas where the water is deeper, farther downstream, near Woods Pond, in Woods Pond, um, in some of the impoundments below Woods Pond, we uh, assumed either mechanical excavation in the wet, which I'm using like a clamshell or some other intrusive technique to remove the sediment through the water column, or actual hydraulic dredging where material is essentially stirred up and, and sucked out with a pump through a, a, uh, a pipe system pumped to a staging area nearby for dewatering and processing. So those are the uh, general assumptions that we used with different removal rates, resuspension rates, and other residual PCB concentrations that depend on the technique. So when we go through the um, evaluation of the, of the different alternatives, just keep in mind a little bit that it was partly based on um, some decisions we made about how the work might be conducted. And okay, now getting to the CMS work plan. This is a document that we submitted to EPA last or February of 2007. I actually believe we gave uh, two CCC meetings in March of 2007, so just about a year ago, and it was approved by EPA in uh, April 2007. So, but what that document did was look at a wide variety of remedial technologies, both for sediments, floodplain soil, and treatment deposition, those three same general categories that we're looking at tonight. There's obviously a large list of potential options, potential work, um, but they were screened in a two-phase process. The first screening was to look at what might be technically implementable on the Housatonic, what might be appropriate given the conditions of the sediments and um, certain other parameters like that, what's been used at other sites successfully, for example. We also, uh, consistent with EPA guidance, did a second screening based on how effective the technologies have shown to be in either other sites or other projects and how implementable or how uh, constructible or, or how much that remedial or how that remedial process can be implemented and whether there's a, a serious issues associated with it. Those were developed into or put into a set of eight remedial alternatives for sediment which were um, eventually approved by EPA. There was a CMS work plan and a supplement to the work plan and then several other letters and documents back and forth either on modeling or on these different alternatives but uh, in, in the end they were approved uh, for use by G or evaluation by GE in the CMS. Okay, as I mentioned, there's eight remedial alternatives to address both the sediment and the riverbank soils in some areas and I'll explain the difference in those two in a second. There's a wide, a wide range in alternatives. They begin with no action as required by the National Contingency Plan, essentially an EPA regulation, that no action be evaluated. It looks at monitored natural recovery in the river, which we'll talk about in a minute, and they, they range up all the way through an extensive removal project in a number of increments and steps along the way. So you'll go from no action at one extreme to a substantial, very large project in the other extreme. The alternatives, as you might expect, focus on the areas with the highest PCB concentrations that remain in the river. The stretch of river, if you think back to the first diagram, the stretch of river between the confluence and Woods Pond Dam has been shown to contain about 90% of the mass in the Housatonic River. 
that's where most of the work is focused on for that reason. There's some, some alternatives do look at some areas below Woods Pond as well, down as far as Rising Pond. Below Rising Pond, what we proposed to EPA and what they approved in the supplement was that monitored natural recovery or essentially no active remediation but letting the natural processes in the river with substantial probably fish, water, and sediment monitoring to, to um, essentially monitor the river over time would be appropriate for study below Rising Pond and through Connecticut. That's about it. Okay, a couple of terms we're going to be talking about tonight in various uh, steps or different places I want to review t right now so that we're all straight on what the language is. This is four examples of some of the technologies that we're going to be using or that, we're going to be, that we did in the evaluation of the CMS. In the upper left corner, what the technology is similar to what we did in the half mile project, which was uh, several feet of removal followed by the placement of a sand isolation, isolation layer to isolate any remaining PCBs at depth, followed by the, an armor stone layer placed on top of the sand to protect that isolation layer from uh, erosional forces in the river. So we're going to call that removal with capping, subsequent capping. There's some areas in the river where, given the depth of the river and the impounded nature of some areas, we think it's appropriate to look at placing a cap, the same kind of cap, but without doing the removal, let's place a cap on top of the sediment in order to isolate PCBs from the environment that are in the underlying sediment themselves. A third kind of technology that we're looking at is removal with backfill. And what that is is removal of a certain number of feet of sediment in areas where you've removed virtually all or all of the PCB material rather than putting back a sand and stone type environment on the bottom of the river, uh, placing backfill back in the river. And the reason we're calling it backfill is, for starters, there's no armor stone layer on top of it to protect it from erosion. And secondly, the assumption we made was that it has similar grain size uh, characteristics to what was taken out. So if it was a sandy gravel mix in the original sediment, we'd put, we assumed to put back a sandy gravel mix as well uh, to simulate or kind of restore the area back to a similar type of environment that's there now. The fourth kind of uh, area we're looking at or technology is called thin layer capping. It's essentially a placement of about a six inch layer in our assumptions of clean sand or silty sand on top of the sediment. It's not a cap per se that's meant to remain in place indefinitely and um, isolate the material underneath. What it does is it's really more of a monitored natural recovery enhancement or acceleration type technique that's been used at some sites in the country. But what you're essentially doing is putting a clean layer down. It might it mix down into some of the upper level of the sediment, but you're dramatically decreasing the sediment PCB concentration in that surface where both the certain bugs and water and, and other um, potential contact could occur. As I mentioned, we looked at bank soils. As, and the photo on the left is a, a photo from the Housatonic, um, probably somewhere in reach 5A, the first five mile reach, but shows the, the steep nature in some areas of the bank. During high flow events, as the water comes up, pieces of that bank will erode, fall into the river, therefore releasing some PCBs into the river as well. Um, and kind of uh, keeping, maybe to some degree, keeping PCB concentrations in the surface of the river higher because of that erosion and deposition of that eroding soil. So we, EPA had done some studies of where that potential erosion was occurring, or erosion was occurring. We incorporated that into the CMS. So for all the alternatives, there, as I mentioned, there's eight alternatives. SED 3 through SED 8 are the major removal and capping and other types of work that's being done. Each of those alternatives addresses the erodible riverbanks in the first seven miles of the river, which is the stretch that primarily where they've been found. The uh, restoration of those areas were assumed to be some combination of armoring, which is placement of stone. Well, the first step would most likely be cutting the bank back to a more stable angle, as it's shown in the photo on the right or the schematic. Some amount of armor stone to um, stabilize that bank and prevent future erosion of that area. And Potentially also we're looking at using bioengineering, which is a planting type technique to help stabilize banks. Or in some very steep areas, we have made an assumption that something called revetment mats, which is a more of a hard, uh, hard type concrete structure that could be used in certain applications on the bank if the banks are sufficiently steep. So addressing the, 
river, the Aurora River banks by themselves is about a 33,000 cubic yard removal based on our estimates. And that volume will be, is a component of the different alternatives that we're going to walk through. So it's really not different. Or each alternative has the same component of work in it to address the banks. But I just wanted to spend a, uh, one chart to review and explain what we were doing or potentially doing there. Okay, so this is a summary chart of the different, of the eight alternatives. We're going to walk through each one individually with a figure to help explain a little bit more about what we're actually looking at in the CMS. But said one and two, as I mentioned, is no action in MNR. So there's no physical work being conducted in those with the exception of monitoring in the MNR example or evaluation of that alternative. Said three through said eight are laid across the top volumes as you might expect, rise from 167,000 up to 400, 550, 800,000, 2.2 million for said A. So as I mentioned, we looked at a wide range of potential projects and potential removals. This is a summary of that. The amount of capping that would be done after removal, which is one of the techniques I went on, shows from 42 acres increasing up to said six and then decreasing, and I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. There's backfill more in, in, in exists in both said seven and said eight. That's because in certain areas, we think we're removing almost all the contaminated sediment, even down to a very low level, and that backfill would be appropriate to look at. There's some areas with capping without removal that varies in these middle alternatives. There's some thin layer capping, different amounts for different alternatives as well. Uh, the second to the last line is a summary of how much of the river bottom in acres we would be addressing by implementing the different alternatives. They range from 139 acres for said three up to about 340 acres of the river bottom for said eight. And as you might expect, given the, the wide range in the, in the uh, level of work and the amount of work that will be done, the first project would start off in about 10 years, we estimate, to conduct, increasing through about 21 for said six and going up as high as 50 to 51 in said eight. Um, given the volumes that would be done and the work that would be done there. I'm now going to walk through a set of figures to illustrate the sediment alternatives. Um, what we have is a, the beginning on the left-hand side, the confluence down through about New Lenox Road, a little farther. We then start up here at the top on the second panel, continue down to, to Woods Pond. Some of the alternatives, as I mentioned, go down as far as Rising Pond. And in those cases, we'll have a second figure which illustrate those. But it shows 5A again here nicely, 5B, 5C in Woods Pond, and it shows the backwaters as well um, in certain parts of the river. Um, go ahead, Mark. On said three, what we see is, given the color code on the right, which allows you to look at the depth of removal, the, the light green is thin layer capping, the dark green is um, more uh, of the capping with an isolation layer with, with an armor stone layer on top of it or just calling it a cap in this example. It shows about two feet of removal in 5A. The areas of blue are areas where no actual um, active remediation would occur, followed by thin layer capping in the lower part of 5C and in Woods Pond. That, and it shows the statistics over here on the right. These are the same numbers that were on the summary matrix, which I just showed you a couple of charts ago, but it shows them each on the individual charts as well. <coughs> Said four, as I mentioned, we're now we're up to about 295,000 cubic yards of removal. And essentially, it's kind of a cascade of additional work as you go through the different sediment alternatives. Two feet of removal from the confluence, now down as far as New Lenox Road. Thin layer capping from New Lenox down to about the midpoint in 5C. Um, instead of thin layer capping here, we're actually doing capping with an isolation layer with an armor stone on top of it. In Woods Pond, it's a combination of removal and capping and thin layer capping in the deeper hole on the edge of Woods Pond, which is about 16 feet deep or so. So it's an area we think that it could be appropriate to placement of a cap. Uh, you also see in some of the bigger backwaters, I think it's backwaters greater than 15 parts per million, um, we were applying a thin layer cap, which you'll see in this light green area. So some of the backwaters with higher PCBs that have been found in the top foot, we've uh, evaluated the installation of a thin layer cap in those areas. Okay, moving on to said five, we're now looking at about 400,000 cubic yards of removal, about an 18-year project. 
we now have two feet of removal down all the way to about the midpoint in 5C. So it's another incremental amount of work on top of uh, said four. Placement of a cap, some thin layer capping in the backwater similar to said four. Some removal and, rep and capping in Woods Pond and rather than thin layer capping in the deep hole, it assumes a uh, thicker um, actual cap with isolation sand and an armor stone layer for protection on top of that. Okay, set five is the first option where we go below Woods Pond. The three Im small impoundments, Columbia Mill, Willow Mill, and Glendale, are three small impoundments that are in that next 18-mile reach below Woods Pond. I, you know, I assume some people here are probably familiar with those locations. They're small kind of run of river impoundments um, with small dams on them that uh, back up the water to some degree. On set five, what we're looking at doing and you know, evaluated in the CMS was placement of a thin layer cap in the 40-acre area of Rising Pond and to see what the effect of doing that would be on the, both the water, the fish, and the sediment levels. Okay, moving on to set six. Now we're looking at about, we've gone from about 410,000 cubic yards to 550,000 cubic yards. Two feet of removal in the whole channel now from the confluence down to the beginning of Woods Pond um, at about a two foot depth with the capping of the remaining of the area afterwards. Woods Pond is similar, a combination of removal and capping. Some of the backwaters, uh, in, instead of doing thin layer capping, we do removal of sediment in these pinker or lighter toned areas if they're greater than 50 parts per million in the top foot, followed by uh, replacement of that material. And in the thin green areas, we do some thin layer capping in those as well. So it's just another, another incremental amount of work. Similarly, below Woods Pond, in the three small impoundments, where last time we weren't doing anything besides monitor natural recovery, we're looking at thin layer capping in these three small impoundments uh, that I mentioned before, Willow Mill, Columbia Mill, and Glendale. And in Rising Pond, we've changed from a pure thin layer cap to a combination of the thin layer cap in the shallower areas and in the deeper area of the, of the pond itself where the old river channel used to flow, which I believe has some higher concentrations. We look at doing a, the dark green area is the area of the cap with uh, isolation sand and armor stone. Okay, two more, two more option, alternatives here. Said seven. We're now looking at uh, substantially more removal, about 800,000 cubic yards of removal. You see we're now looking at a red color, which was associated with three to three and a half feet of removal in the channel. So it's not two feet anymore. Now we're looking at extra depth of removal. Changing over to, looks like two and a half feet of removal in 5B, a couple feet of removal in 5C, two and a half feet of removal in Woods Pond now instead of a foot and a half with some capping in the deep hole. Um, similar work in the backwaters is the last alternative. And in wood, and below, in reach sevens, the three small impoundments, we're now doing a combination of removal, which are shown in the lighter areas. I think it's over 3 ppm in the surface, followed by restoration and capping in the green areas. And similarly, in rising pond, some removal of some of the higher levels, not that the level's that high, but above three parts per million, followed by restoration and, and some capping of the lower level areas. Okay, looking at set eight, which is the last sediment alter alternative we're evaluating in the document, this is removal of all sediment greater than one part per million in the river. So uh, we looked at the data that had been collected both by GE and EPA, determined depths of removal that corresponded to that level. We see in the river channel itself, uh, it's a brown color, and we actually labeled the depth here, but it's about four feet of removal now in certain areas down through 5A going three to three and a half down to Woods Pond, some removal in the backwaters. Woods Pond, we're looking at removal of about six feet. It's brown, which is this scale, but we actually put a small six feet removal here um, to take out everything over one part per million, we feel. <coughs> and in the impoundments, it's the same. It's, it's a still a one part per million cleanup um, goal. Um, so we have removal of about two feet of removal in each of the three impoundments. In Rising Pond, which has been more had heavier siltation over time, we're looking at about seven feet of removal, um, and those areas would be restored with backfill, assuming um, under the assumptions in the CMS. This is a 2.25 million cubic yard project. Uh, you see addressing about 340 cubic yards, as I mentioned before, and we estimate, um, given the constraints in the river and how the work could be done, that it would require about 50 years to conduct that kind of project.
I'm not going to let Stu, he's going to walk through the evaluation criteria that we use in the CMS and to talk about the criteria as well. Thanks, Andy. Again, my name is Stu Masur. Andy's given you a nice overview of the eight sediment alternatives. I'm going to spend the next half an hour or so going through the evaluation of those alternatives. And he's thrown an awful lot of stuff at you guys. One thing I'll point out is the, uh, the, the fact sheet that was put together by EPA has some good information in it that you can keep handy as I'm talking on page five. There's actually a table up at the top that summarizes what we've proposed to do in each reach. And when you see some of the graphics and discussion here over the next half hour, and you're wondering where is 5A, you can go back to page two, and there's a, a nice map that shows the location. So between page two and page five, there's a good summary, and I, I think to have this handy will be helpful. Okay, so after we had established the alternatives, um, we basically took a process that was defined in the consent decree to evaluate each of those alternatives, and we have done it both in detail for each alternative, and then after we did that, we did what's called a comparative evaluation, where for each of these criteria, we actually took them and looked at the pros and cons, comparing them to one another. To run through these pretty quickly, um, the first three are referred to as general standards. The general standards are ones that must be met by each alternative, and the first one is overall protection of human health and the environment which takes into account EPA's risk assessments. Uh, it also considers, as I'll discuss uh, a little bit later here, what are known as the balancing factors as well. To evaluate risk in total, you need to consider not only the risk assessment, but long-term impacts from implementing a remedy, any short-term impacts that might occur during that implementation, and also gives consideration to the IMPGs. Uh, the second is referred to as the control of source of releases. Uh, with each of the alternatives, after we've run the model, we want to see how, to the extent to which it reduces the potential for transport of PCBs in the water column and into the floodplain. And the third would be called compliance with federal and state ARARs. We look at the various regulations that might apply if we were to implement these to determine the extent to which we can uh, meet those, the, the regulations, or if not, we might need a waiver to do so. Uh, the selection decision factors, and there's six of them. Uh, I've mentioned them a little bit here already, long-term long reliability and effectiveness. Uh, what do we see happening after this has been implemented? What kind of impacts in the long term might it have to, to uh, the community or to the environment? Uh, again, attainment of IMPGs, which we'll go through. Also, uh, what, how much does each alternative reduce the toxicity, the mobility, or the volume of the, the uh, waste that we're, that we're removing? and that we see left in the river. Short-term effectiveness considers impacts during implementation to the community, the workers, and the environment. Uh, implementability, uh, we look at the, the actual way we're going to do this and determine how difficult it's going to be to implement it, what sort of issues might we have while we're implementing it, and what is the availability of services, materials, and space necessary to implement it. And finally, cost. Um, so you can see now we've got eight alternatives I'm going to talk about. There's, there's nine criteria to sort of expedite the walk through this while the document goes into great detail with each of these. We've tried to focus in this presentation on the ones that we think are the biggest differentiators. So I'm not going to hit every single one, but I'll hit the ones that we think probably highlight the differences of the alternatives best. And if you have questions for criteria that aren't addressed, you can either come ask us or have fun reading the document here afterwards. Um, so the first, I guess first with sediments, the control of source of releases. Um, one thing that I'll, I'll mention starting off here, we're looking at the extent to which each of these remedies can reduce the transport of PCBs in the water column or onto the floodplain. Uh, we're, we're looking, at, we're running the model starting, as Andy pointed out, at the confluence uh, of the east and west branch. And one thing that's a bit of a constant here, we need to look at what's coming in from above. Um, and to highlight quickly, we've looked, looking at that data, and there's been some data collected recently, as, as recent as last year, to see what sort of changes have we seen over the past several years from work that's already been done outside of the river, as well as work that was conducted in the half mile and the mile and a half. And the data that was collected is shown, we're seeing a three to five fold uh, 
reduction in PCB transport into the rest of river uh, currently compared to the historic data we've seen. Moving forward now, the model is going to start at that point and the model will take the various alternatives and run them for a 52 a year more period to see what happens when we implement these remedies as far as changed conditions. And with regard to controlling source releases, one of the outputs of the model is it will tell us what changes we're seeing in the PCB concentrations or loads in the water column. So we can go to various points in the river, run the model for the various alternatives and see what sort of changes we might have. And that's going to lead us to the next chart here. And uh, give you a moment to look at it. Um, and as, as you're looking, just to describe what we've got here, um, on the y-axis, we've on the y-axis we've plotted percent reduction from current P, in current PCB load in the water column. In other words, after the model has run for 52 or so years for each of the remedies, what loading do we see compared to the conditions right now in the river? Um, and we've plotted along the x-axis each of the eight alternatives. Um, I guess looking looking at it from an overview perspective, due to change conditions and continued uh, remediation that GE plans to do over the next several years upstream of the confluence, we're seeing for sediment alternatives one or two, whereas Andy had pointed out, we're, we're essentially doing nothing active, a, about a 40% reduction in the PCB transport 52 years out. So that, that, that is a bit of a baseline for all the rest of these alternatives. Beyond To the work will, where all of the active work is being done in reaches five and six, we see a 90% reduction in PCB transport associated with that alternative. And if you recall, and as you have in that chart, as we work our way through alternatives four or five and up through eight, we do, we're doing more and more active work in the river. And uh, while we are seeing some reductions, the reductions are incrementally quite a bit less than what you're seeing from doing, from going from from implementing sediment alternative three. Um, another one of the criteria was long-term reliability and effectiveness. There's three subcategories that we're going to look at here. The first being magnitude of residual risk. What, ki what kind of a reduction do we see and, uh, at the, after these alternatives have been implemented? Um, I guess stepping down actually to that chart, or to, the, to that, and I'm going to go through the next two in the next series of charts. Um, as, I, as we've just gone through, the source control and remediation activities that are near the plant are showing uh, through, through work that's being done upstream as well as through changes in the river conditions over time, a fairly substantial recovery and change in, at the various reaches in the river. Um, now what we're about to do is, is run the model and uh, and see what happens when we do thin layer capping, when we do capping, when we do, do removal, that will, will uh, cause further changes. Uh, the model is going to be used to predict the extent to which the sediment alternatives further reduce PCB concentrations in the sediment, water, and fish. And since the fish tend to see what's in the water column as well as what's in the sediments, uh, and the trends that we're seeing are similar. The, the, the graphics that I'm going to show you on the next chart here uh, represent the fish tissue data. Okay, and again, uh, using your fact sheet, if it's going to help you, what we've done here is same thing. We've run the model for 52 plus years. This is the data that we're seeing uh, in the... Basically, it, the average fish fillet concentrations uh, that we're seeing in various reaches at various locations in the river, fish that are collected from reach 5A, fish that are collected from 5B and 5C, which if you look at your map are all uh, upstream of its pond, what would the fish tissue concentrations be in reach 8, or 6 rather, which is Woods Pond, reach 8, which is the rising pond, and then all the way down at Connecticut. Um, what we don't have here is the current conditions, but you know, ba basically looking at the current conditions and comparing to what we would see after the models run, sediment alternatives one and two show a reduction of around 43 to 60% in the actual fish tissue PCB concentrations, uh, with the concentrations ranging anywhere from about uh, around one or less in the fish down in Connecticut up to around 
eight and a half or nine at uh, reach five B. Uh, if sediment alternative three were, were implemented, we would see uh, about a 99% reduction in reach five A in those fish and a 70 to 95% reduction in the other reaches. Uh, the, the greatest reduction being in 5A where the removal and the calving is occurring. And you know, we are, as shown here, we're seeing you know, further downstream fairly significant drops from the, uh, from the work that's being done up in, up in the channel in Reach 5 and Woods Pond itself. Uh, and similar to what we saw for the loading, uh, the, the water column loading reaches four and eight yield small incremental improvements. Sorry, I've forgotten the process. See right a mic. Um, if in fact you use the effectiveness of uh, of uh, the one and two as the baseline, and you created another chart that showed the difference between that 40% reduction, or actually the 90% reduction, and the other five uh, choices, you'd actually have a graph that looked very different. Um, and I'm just pointing this out because it's it's, it's really a question of how you create a graph and how you present data that makes an impression. If you want to make a visual impression to produce a certain kind of result, you, you use the numbers in a certain way. Um, I could present the exact same data that you have there and make it look as if the difference between solution three and solution four through eight was a huge difference. I'm just pointing that out because those of us who have a little background in statistics, um, understand that there's a great way to sell a product and there's a, a less uh, effective way to sell the product and, and, and we've got a product that's being sold here. You were just trying to get him, get my attention. Under sediment um, three, will the fish be edible someday? I mean, we, we will get to that in a few minutes. So rather than answer questions uh, uh, for charts that I've got in the future, I think we should just wait, if that's OK. I mean, I will say, Benno, I don't know, maybe you have a background in statistics, but this is the data from EPA's model. It is not. This is the data plotted. I'd love to see your plot. You should submit it to EPA in your comments, and I'd love to take a look at it because this is not about selling something. It's about showing the public and showing EPA and the agencies what, is a, what the model showed for these eight alternatives and what we think should be done. EPA makes a decision ultimately. So obviously you should give me your input, but I don't think you should be characterizing this as anything but what the data from the model was. So thank you. Okay, uh, as I had mentioned, there's three, three different ways to look at long-term reliability and effectiveness. Uh, the second is to basically look at the adequ adequacy and reliability of the alternative. Once we implement it, uh, is it going to stay during high storm events? If it's not going to stay, what sort of changes might we see in the river system that could occur from, say, a high storm event? So we use the model again to help us here. Recognizing we've got capping, backfilling, and thin layer cap and various uh, sort of uh, mixes of it in the different alternatives. We, we use the model to assess the stability uh, over a 50 plus year period, which has a series of high flow events. And the output from the model allowed us to look at changes in bed elevation. In other words, in those areas where we've laid a cap, what's the elevation uh, after a high storm event comes through, is it higher or is it lower, which might suggest things have deposited on it or the cap is possibly eroded. Um, and also we're able to, to determine the PCB concentrations in those areas to see whether something's changed as well. 
And we did that. And the next chart shows a summary of that. Um, this basically, the chart is broken down by, by river reach again. Um, and along the y-axis and along the x-axis, if we look at the percent area eroded, in channel the five reaches, we looked at areas in the various alternatives where we had capping, where we had thin layer capping, and where we had backfill. And the model was able to tell us, uh, and we used in this particular case one inch, what percentage of the area that got capped or thin layer capped would erode down to less than one inch. And the numbers that we've got here represent the results of that. For the areas that we capped, where Andy told you we were going to put an armor stone to make sure we had a stable bed, we don't see erosion. Thin layer capping, which, as he described, is not necessarily designed to be a stable surface. It's there to put cleaner material over the PCBs and, and provide a cleaner surface uh, where mixing can occur at times. And you may see some movement, and in fact, we did. The most movement we saw was down around Columbia Mill Pond and, and Willow Mill Pond. And we weren't surprised because those are areas where we've got higher flows and, and there's a more potential for, the, for that cap, cap material to move. And in the backfill areas, uh, you know, we had a range of, of places. Again, Andy mentioned, we didn't put that stuff down to, with a stable surface. It's the same material that's there now. And we weren't surprised to see that there was some movement. Um, when you look at the actual data that, that was generated, the concentrations, if you look at the concentrations that are there now and you compare them to the concentrations in the surface sediments af right after a high storm event, basically we, we were still seeing you know, in, in reaches five and uh, six, anywhere from 90, 90%, 99% reduction in the PCB concentration. So where we have put caps or thin layer caps up there or backfill, the, the, the low concentrations that are achieved right afterwards are being maintained even after a high storm event. Um, a little bit less, but still recognizing that, you know, you've got half the concentrations after these high storm events that you do now. We see moderately good results in Columbia Pond and in Willow Mill Pond and, and uh, in Rising Pond where it's more depositional, we saw less movement there. So the model was telling us that for the locations we've chosen to apply these various types of technologies, uh, the model's saying that, that they should stay stable and they're doing a good job of keeping the PCB concentrations down. Okay, and third, uh, more of a sort of a qualitative assessment would be con considering the potential long-term adverse impacts on the environment. Um, all, all alternatives that involve removal or capping are going to have some sort of a long-term impact. Uh, installation of a thin layer cap or a cap without prior removal will have impacts on the shallow water areas. If you think about it, and Andy, Andy showed you the, the drawing earlier, if along the perimeters of the river, if you're laying a cap, and it's six inches thick, the elevation now is going to be, unless the sediments consolidate under it, is going to be six inches higher. So in places, for instance, along the peripheries of the river or the backwaters where you've got wetlands, you raise the bed elevation six inches, or, or with the cap, you raise it 18 inches. It could change the type of wetland plants that grow there. So the, the periphery where you're raising the bed elevation is likely to have some long-term impacts. Um, bank stabilization. Andy mentioned that we're going to cut the banks back. While they're erodible, there's habitat in and along those banks right now, and by changing those, you're going to have a long-term impact on probably the types of, of uh, organisms that use those banks. Um, implementation of the sediment alternatives could impact the, uh, the floodplain itself. We need to actually build access roads and staging areas to get in here, to get in and do the work. And in those areas, we're going to have to cut down trees. And so from an aesthetics perspective, perspective, you're going to see a change in, in parts of the floodplain through implementation of the sediment alternatives. And for, those, for the biota that lives there, they're going, to, they're going to be pushed out of those areas for some amount of time as well. Um, we did put some conceptual design drawings together on how would we implement these remedies and did some calculations on the number of acres of staging areas and roads we'd need. And for Sediment alternatives three through eight, where we're actually doing something active, we've we've for now assumed that it would be it would range the impacts would range anywhere from 90 to 118 acres of floodplain. Okay, we're going to move on to the next criteria here. That's a differentiator, and it's attainment of IMPGs. Um, Andy gave you a bit of an overview on them. The IMPGs 
uh, for the sediments were developed for, in, for three different exposure or three different scenarios here, human direct contact with sediment, human consumption of fish, and then various ecological receptors. He showed you a number of charts. So you recognize now that each of these may have a, a range of numbers. And they also have, they're also considered in, in various areas. For instance, for human, for human exposure, the river's broken up into eight exposure areas. So what we end up doing is looking at the actual concentration in the sediments, in this case, after the model's been run for each of the alternatives, compare it to those IMPGs and see if we have, see if the alternative gets the concentrations down to something within that range that's acceptable for direct human contact. And I guess going, looking at that particular uh, set first, the, what the model should be talked about, a range that was referred to as the reason, reasonable maximum exposure range or the RMEs. That's the range where there's, where there's more exposure uh, assumed to occur. And what we've done here is plotted the, the, the range for the RMEs down here in dark gray. For purposes of the CMS, uh, and I think based on uh, EPA, some, some, some agreed upon EPA evaluations here, uh, 50 meals per day, or I'm sorry, 50 meals per year has been assumed to represent uh, unrestricted fish consumption. So that's what this range right here would represent. And then the other, the other uh, group, which is uh, CTE, which is more of, uh, I guess, less consumption of fish assumed here to be 14 meals per year. Uh, this is the range of IMPGs that that is associated with. So giving that a bit as, as a background, what you're looking at here now is what, what is the model telling us for the eight alternatives when it's run for this 52 plus years? What sort of changes are we seeing? And you know, where are they going relative to these, these various ranges of IMPGs? Um, the one on the top is sediment alternatives one and two. You'll see a steady decline, which again is associated with natural recovery in the river as well as things that are going on upstream of the confluence. Um, and when we look at the lines down here, the, the one, basically the one on the bottom blue here, which is sediment alternative three, which overlays both set four and set five. Um, while for none of these we see achievement of unrestricted, um, in, uh, unrestricted consumption at reach 5A, which is something I should have pointed out. Hopefully you picked up on this. This is just fish up in reach 5A, which is the upper five miles. Um, however, the, the, each of these alternatives, with the exception of one or two, over time uh, would get the fish concentrations down so that there could be limited consumption. Just so you know that, I guess, this, uh, the hump here, for, for sediment alternative seven and eight, where we're doing a fair amount more removal and we're putting backfill back, which is not an armored stable surface. At around year 30, we see uh, a high flow event, we see some scour, and we see some suspension of low concentrations uh, uh, you know, with the backfill, which brings the fish tissue concentrations up a little bit, and then they drop, they tail off towards the end. Okay, now, now we've, We've done the same thing, but we've moved down and said, what are the fish going to look like in Woods Pond for each of these alternatives? And again, for the, for the extent of the model run, we don't see, with any of these alternatives, we do not see achievement of unrestricted fish consumption. Um, looking sort of at the, at the time series going across the graph here, uh, sediment alternative three, we see we reach a plateau that's, uh, I don't know, I think it's around 0.7 part per million in the fish tissue at about uh, 10 or 15, about 10 years, which is when that alternative is expected to be completed. For these other alternatives that take longer to implement, uh, achievement of these, sort of these plateaus t tends to take longer, with the longest being sediment alternative eight, which if you recall was going to take about 50 years to implement. Okay, next chart. Okay, we've now moved another 18 miles down the river, 18 miles from Woods Pond. This is the data, this is the output from the model running the eight, al the eight alternatives out for over 60 years, uh, or I'm sorry, over 52 years. 
Um, similar to the last chart, uh, at the end of the model run, we do not see any of the alternatives if, if implemented um, achieving an unrestrict, unrestricted fish consumption. Um, a number of them do uh, get, to get the fish tissue concentrations down so that 14 meals per year would be acceptable. Um, uh, and again, we've got, I guess we've got a hump here. And again, that's sediment alternative eight. In this particular case, um, what this is showing is a bit of resuspension into the water column that's, that's simulated with the model while dredging is occurring down in rising ponds. So and we see a number of things with the output that suggest the model is recognizing and, and utilizing the, the input data properly. Okay, and finally, this is Bull's Bridge uh, data. Same scenario here. We've run the model for 52 plus years. Uh, a bit different uh, down there. The concentrations are quite a bit lower. For each alternative, we're starting off uh, with fish tissue concentrations at a level that falls within the range of limited consumption. And over time, we see each of these, with the exception of sediment alternatives uh, one, and two, bringing the fish tissue concentrations down to a point where uh, unrestricted consumption could occur. Just looking at the time frames to achieve that, sediment alternatives, uh, I guess, three, four, five, and six all achieve that point, at, which is right here, at about 20 years. Uh, because of the extent of work that's being done and the time it takes to do so, it takes about 30 years to achieve that point if you were to implement sediment alternative seven and sediment alternative eight uh, sort of comes in and out at about 40 years and then finally uh, dips down at about 50 years. So it takes a bit longer to get to that same point. Okay. I think maybe this is the time to ask that question. Um, I'm seeing from the charts that you have presented that Sediment alternative three, which is GE's preferred alternative, um, never gives us um, really clean edible fish in Massachusetts. Uh, yet some of the higher alternatives of cleanup do come very close to attaining that goal. And it seems that at Bull's Bridge way down in Connecticut, it's the only place that we really get down with sediment three to, to levels that uh, at least make me comfortable. And <clears throat> The other thing I don't quite understand is you divide uh, the upper five miles as different than Woods Pond, but when I canoe from Woods Pond um, upstream, I go right into that reach, and I see fish swimming throughout that whole reach, and those fish up in upstream are the same fish that could migrate the three or four miles down to Woods Pond. So I don't quite understand that there's this uh, invisible fence there between the fish that these fish up in that five-mile stretch could be safer than the fish that are in Woods Pond. I think there's going to be intermingling of those fish. I mean, the way that the output, the way we've set this up is consistent with the way we agreed to in the, in, in, with EPA when, when uh, the work plan was approved. It had to be broken into some number of stretches, and this was the manageable number that was agreed upon so that we could get output. Um, I guess if you go back a couple slides here. Go back, uh, yeah, yeah. Said threes into blue, it's the same line essentially or relatively close as a number of other alternatives in that first five mile reach. I, mean, I know the colors may not be the best, but I mean, obviously compared to said one and two, but I mean, these are very close in terms of time, in terms of where they achieve the level. I mean, obviously, this is based on the assumptions or the way EPA's models put together. And going down the river, yes, you're right. I mean, in alternative, in Woods Pond, we're looking at roughly 0.7 versus 0.3. So we're talking several tenths of a part per million in a fish fillet 52 or so years from now. I mean, maybe said three is as effective, is as, effective as those. And may, or maybe the model's exactly right, but there is a small variation in the effectiveness of these alternatives in Woods Pond. Rising Pond, which is the next one, there's more of a difference between I mean, said three and said four as I walk through the alternatives and you look in your um, fact sheet, don't have actual, actual active remediation below Woods Pond. So these levels tend to stay around one and a half parts per million or so 
as predicted by the model in Rising Pond, as opposed to a small alternatives with more active work in the in that area, get down to levels of around 0.3 to 0.4 parts per million compared to 1.5. But um, and then in Connecticut, you we already went over, but. So I mean, I'm not saying I don't, I don't disagree that there's some variations there, but certainly reach 5A, they're consistently the same. I mean, they're almost the same alternative for every one of the sediment alternatives. So anyways, I'm sure we can talk about this some more. Um, I Thanks. have one more question. Identify yourself. Sure, it's Benno Friedman again. Um, you know, this perhaps is just one of many examples where um, a computer model or a video game tends to be a little different than real life, given the fact that you can't uh, make an assessment uh, based on anything about where that fish is going to swim, um, how far upstream or downstream it's going to go, and where it lays its eggs. But the question that I actually had was, did you hypothecate what it would take to get uh, the, f the fish from the five-mile reach all the way down into that, um, into that dark gray layer. I mean, what, what kind of remediation would it take to do that? Um, is that you know, just totally impossible? Um, was it even thought about? I mean, if you were to think about what sediment alternative eight was, sediment alternative eight involves removing sediments to depths up to six feet. Uh, throughout the entire channel and the backwater areas for the entire stretch of the river from the confluence down to Woods Pond Dam. So for the time frame over which the model was run here, and in this particular case, this was run out 81 years. I keep saying 52 or more years. The criteria for running the model was that the, every alternative would be run for at least 52 years or for alternatives that took 51 years to implement, at least 30 years after the completion of that work. So this is telling us that even with the most significant uh, removal alternative that we are not going to achieve unrestricted fish consumption in this reach of the river. Is it feasible, imaginary or a fantasy or Walt Disney World, but is it feasible to get those numbers down into what you know has been really the vision of a lot of people in Berkshire County, which is to have a rim river that um, can be fished, where the fish can be eaten, where you can swim in it, where you can play in it, um, is was that concept an endpoint that was ever realistically explored? I, I mean, all we can do is tell you what the output of the model is. These models took many, many weeks to run. Um, I don't, given the data we're seeing here, I don't know what more you could do in the river to achieve something lower. I mean, the model is telling us, based, based on the model results, that you are not going to achieve within, at least within the 81-year period that it's run, doing anything with the sediments in Reach 5-6, unrestricted consumption. Now, as we pointed out, and as this shows, though, we, do, we will see limited consumption uh, from many of these alternatives. Um, we are... Due to take a break at 7, there are about 6 or 7 more slides on the sediment topic, then we're going to go to the floodplain, then we're going to go to the disposal topic. So we have quite a bit of distance to go. So I'm going to ask you to just hold your questions until we get through this end of the... Um, I have been taking the comments from the Citizens Coordinating Council members, uh, but I think we're just going to try and get through um, the next 6 slides and take our break. And if we, if we finish the six slides before 7 o'clock, we'll take some questions then. Okay. Um, I guess to summarize the last series of charts here, the model results indicate that no sediment alternative would achieve fish PCB levels that EPA considers uh, protective of, of unrestricted fish consumption, uh, which means for some time, some sort of a fish consumption advisory will need to be uh, this is in Massachusetts into the foreseeable future. Uh, sets three through eight achieve levels that EPA considers uh, acceptable for limited consumption, which is 14 meals per year in, the in some of the Massachusetts reaches, and these numbers tend to increase as you saw as we do as we go from set three to set eight. And as I showed you on the last chart in Connecticut, using this uh, 
the one-dimensional model that Andy described briefly before, uh, extrapolation suggests that for sets three through eight, you would achieve unrestricted fish consumption uh, within or very shortly after the model period. Okay, so we've covered the human direct contact. We just spent several minutes talking about fish consumption. Now we're looking at what sort of exposure concerns might exist to the various ecological receptors that live in the river or use the river. Um, as indicated over here on the, on the uh, right side in the legend, um, you know, we've looked at fish eating birds, we've looked at cold water fish, which are trout, we've looked at amphibians, which, such as uh, frogs, we've looked at the macroinvertebrates that live in the sediments, we've looked at threatened and endangered species, which includes bald eagles, and we've also looked at uh, the warm water fish like bass. And this chart is similar to ones I showed you earlier. This is the output that we would see 52 plus years after we run the model for each of the eight alternatives. And uh, I guess what we're noting first of all is uh, for all alternatives, including said one and two, the, the, the warm water fish and the threatened and endangered species or the bald eagles, we, fought, we achieve concentrations uh, that are fall within the range uh, that EPA has established uh, as acceptable. Um, as we move on to sediment alternative three, which is right here, we see uh, for the mac uh, benthic macroinvertebrates and for the cold water fish, we see those jump up to 100% achievement. So in all areas, the concentrations are fall within that IMPG range, and we see that extend for those organisms for the rest of the alternatives. And for uh, for the, for the fish-eating birds, we saw them come up to about 40%, and the amphibians up to about 60 And what we see as we, as we move into alternatives four, five, and six, we see, you know, continued, uh, we see more and more areas where these organisms would reside. We see achievement of the, uh, of within the range of the IMPGs with uh, amphibians reaching 100% when alternative said eight is implemented. Okay, real quickly, reduction in toxicity, mobility, and volume. Uh, reduction of toxicity uh, in the true sense gives consideration to the extent to which treatment might reduce the toxicity of materials. At this point, we're only talking about removing the materials, so in that sense, there is really no reduction in toxicity through treatment. However, by removing you know, upwards of 2.2 million yards of sediment, uh, and in, in other alternatives doing capping and thin layer capping, we are re basically reducing the net toxicity of the sediments that are in the river after the materials come out. Uh, in doing so, and as I showed you in that chart for the mass loading at, at uh, Rising Pond Dam and Woods Pond Dam and the load into the uh, floodplain, we get a reduction in mobility as we implement these alternatives. We get some from SEDS 1 and 2 just through implementation of work above the confluence that's going to continue to occur. And for SEDS through 8, we see sort of a progression of more and more reduction in mobility and toxicity, or mobility rather, as you cap or remove more material. And with reduction in volume, when we go from SED 3 to SED 8, we see an increasing reduction in the volume of PCBs in the river. Short-term effectiveness, which considers impacts that occur during the actual imp implementation, not afterwards, uh, we would expect to see as well. well we ex would expect to see potential impacts to the water column, the air, and the biota while we're actually in the river doing the, the removal action. Um, as I mentioned to you before, we're, we're planning in long reaches 5A and 5B to, to lay some of the banks back and to stabilize them. In doing so, we're going to take down trees, and we're going to impact habitat and organisms that live in those reaches. And there's also going to be some loss of habitat and destruction of the, or disruption of the biota, rather, when we lay the roads in the support areas to support the removal actions themselves. Um, impacts to the community while we're doing these activities, it's going to impact recreation that might occur in the river, on the banks, or in portions of the floodplain. Um, and something that's a little bit more quantifiable here, there's, could, there, could be a, there will be a significant uh, uh, increased noise and truck traffic from implementing these alternatives. This chart, by the way, represents, because we're just looking at uh, at the removal alternative. We're not looking at what happens with the material once it's removed. This shows the number of trucks that would be required to bring in the backfill, 
the capping material and what would be necessary to restore these areas after we remove them. And we've, we basically uh, would see truck traffic or number of truck trips ranging anywhere from about 20,000 up to about 211,000 truck trips to support just bringing the material in. And this, if coupled with a removal alternative that had to haul the stuff off site, uh, you, you, the numbers would basically double. Okay, so I guess wrapping these things together now sort of into an assessment of the overall protection of human health and the environment. Um, summarizing a few key factors, uh, the first couple of bullets at the top, we're, we're seeing that uh, with regard to PCB transport, we see a significant uh, reduction in transport from implementation, probably the most significant from implementation of, of uh, sediment alternative three with uh, incremental additional reductions for implementing sets four through eight. Similarly, uh, if you recall from the graph we had up here with fish tissue, um, we see significant achievements of fish reduction, fish tissue reduction for, with implementation of sediment alternative three with some incremental benefits from implementing sets four through eight. Um, with regard to uh, exposure, all the alternatives achieve protective levels for direct contact by humans with sediments. With regard to fish consumption risks, the model indicates that there's no alternative in Massachusetts that would achieve unrestricted fish consumption, uh, but that sets three through eight would achieve levels that EPA considers protective for limited consumption in some reaches in Massachusetts. And in that, in that case, then um, fish consumption advisories would need to continue for in the foreseeable future to provide protection. Uh, ecological impact containment, uh, the benthic macroinvertebrates, threatened endangered species, and the, and the, the bass and the trout. Uh, we hit the range uh, for each of those species in all areas for sediment alternatives three through eight. For the fish eating birds and the amphibians, the RMPG, we hit the IMPG ranges in about 40 to 50 percent of the areas for set three and 80 to 100 percent of the areas in sets four through eight. Um, with regard to the time to achieve, some of the graphs that we had up there uh, looking at fish uh, consumption or fish tissue changes, the signif significant variations are noted in the time it takes to get to the different, uh, to see the benefits that occur where the things plateau due to implementation of the remedies. Uh, variations that we saw were small in 5A since we're, we're starting up there and we're doing mo mostly the same thing. We didn't really see much, we didn't see a change by going deeper. Um, and those changes in Woods Pond, sediment set three seems to achieve the benefits at about 15 years, while uh, at the other end, set eight, it takes about 45 years before we saw that flatten out. So in conclusion, for the sediment alternatives, GE believes that set three to eight all achieve the general standards of the permit, which were the first three that I mentioned needed to be met, and have concluded that among those alternatives, based on consideration of the balancing and selection factors, which are the, the other six, that set three is best suited to, to meet the general standards. And uh, primarily uh, based on the fact that the, we get a large reduction in PCB transport and PCB concentrations in the fish through inflammation of set three. It has the fewest adverse impacts on the environment and would cause the least disruption to the local communities, can be implemented the quickest, and uh, it would be most cost effective and the cost we're going to wait and talk talk about a little bit later. So this is the point in time where we plan to take a break and when we come back we're going to talk about the floodplains but it, before we do that. Before we take the break I said if we finish before seven um, this section that we would take a few questions. So how many people have questions at this point about the sediment stuff? Um, I'm going to go first to the table of the CCC members, and then I'm going to come back to the people whose cards are up in this, in this area. I would say we'll get two or three, four at the most. How does the um, model deal with those high flow events? You mentioned uh, a couple of high flow events worked into the model. Uh, can you explain that a little bit to me? Yeah, I have no clue where the question's coming from. Right here. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm going I'm to ask Kevin Russell from QEA to answer that question since he's intimate with the model. Sure. The, the model was set up for a 52-year period, and we used um, historical flow records from the river over t the last 26 years. So there's a number of 
high flow events that have been measured within the, within the system that were used to represent, so they're realistic. In addition, um, EP, we worked with EPA and developed a synthesized hydrograph that represents one of the largest historical events ever measured on the system. Those simulated flows are used to look at how the river will respond to these high flow conditions and the model predicts how fast the water will move, how much sediment erosion and deposition will occur, and likewise how much PCBs will move around during those events. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Uh, I think we've seen a, an increased frequency in high flow events in, in recent years. I think that's pretty well established. So does, does do you feel you adequately uh, address that issue um, with the data you're using? It's a good representation of the historical uh, hydrograph, which goes back almost 100 years in some locations. Uh, Ken Finkelstein, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, through the, uh, at the beginning of the talk where Andy Silver was talking, showed the uh, duration of the different, uh, different alternatives. And I was wondering if that includes the mitigation, what, what some would call restoration of the habitat that would be disrupted through the, uh, through the removal. And then the second part, if, if that's the case, uh, if you could describe some of the challenges and some of the work that would need to be done to bring the habitat back. Cause my thinking is that that's as important as the removal is the uh, recreation of the habitat. Yeah, I'm probably going to turn to someone else to help me. T to answer your first question, yes, the time frame that we had up there included the time to restore, basically to complete the alternative from mobilizing to the site, implementing the remedy, to getting the restoration done. And then the each of the alternatives includes, you know, a, a program right now in the CMS, a proposed program both a long-term monitoring program as well as a short-term to, to sort of track those, the, uh, the restoration and the progress of the, not only the restoration, but the progress of the alternative. I'd like just to add to that. Uh, what Stu was talking about was the construction period, the 51 years. That's not the time for uh, the monitoring and measuring of the success of the restoration. Um, that, that would add on to that period. That's the, the 51 years is the point that you complete the actual physical restoration, not the growth of the plants or whatever else would go in there. Okay, one more question. Oh, sorry. You're still, still going. Uh, my name is Chuck Harmon with AMEC Earth and Environmental, uh, working with GE on the uh, ecological impact and restoration aspects. And I hate to say this, but could you repeat the second half of the question so I make sure I get it all? Well, well, clearly, if you're going to recreate this habitat, and many of us have been up and down the river, it's quite a few challenges to it. And so I, I hadn't heard the word mitigation once throughout the entire presentation, so I wanted to be sure that that was the case. And had you, you know, if there was been some thought from GE on, 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 these, on the challenges behind doing such. I well, mean, the, uh, the mile and a half and the half mile is relatively simple when compared to this part of the river. Well, I actually was involved with the half mile, so I understand the, uh, you know, the restoration aspect of it. And you're absolutely correct. The, the rest of the river part will be very challenging, not only from the main channel aspect of it, but also moving back up into the, uh, to the backwaters and to the floodplain area when we get into that, uh, looking at some of the wetland issues that have to be restored. Uh, the objective is that there are going to be two types of... Um, restoration activities that are going to be accomplished or implemented in the Restor River. Uh, these will be detailed in a restoration plan that I'm sure will be, you know, come out, you know, during the design phase of some of these uh, particular alternatives. Uh, but, you know, there will be things like uh, trying to create suitable uh, benthicon vertebrate habitat, you know, based on elevations of uh, restored sediments and, and the type of uh, rocks that are put down, armor stone that are put down. There will be active type, uh, you know, ventures in terms of, you know, putting plantings. Uh, we may end up considering uh, the use of supplemental habitat features uh, to help increase the habitat. Uh, I think where, if you talk about the complexities of it, where we really will have probably uh, more complex issues to deal with will be up in the floodplain. Uh, when we start looking at some of the vernal pool issues and the emergent and plustern wetland habitats that have to be restored. Okay, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The presentation goes on into some of that as we go forward with the floodplain section.
Um, we are scheduled to take a break. I, I don't think we should all leave the room because it will take 20 minutes for us all to get back in the room. So I'm going to suggest that we um, stand up, stretch, talk, and that in 10 minutes we reconvene. So um, is that, that enough for you? Good. 710. I was asked a little while ago to try to hold the microphone farther away, so I'll try that. Um, so this isn't my area of expertise. Okay, I'm here to talk a little bit about, go over the introductory section to the floodplain alternatives. What we're going to go over today is what's in the CMS, obviously what's in the report. And what that is in the floodplain is seven alternatives to deal with the floodplain. Again, similar to the sediment, they range from no action, it's required by the NCP, up through a very large removal of floodplain soil. Um, four of the alternatives are based on meeting human health IMPGs from the less conservative 10 to the minus fourth excess cancer or one in 10,000 up through meeting um, <coughs> 10 to the minus 6, they're 1 in a million excess cancer. Two of, two of the alternatives are called threshold-based, where rather than setting them up to meet a human health alternative, we set them up to remove all soil at the top foot greater than a certain concentration, and then we evaluate them against how well they meet the human health and ecological IMPGs for the floodplain. Um, similar to the sediment, they're based uh, predominantly or, or based on what's in the human health risk assessment and the ecological risk assessment that was developed by EPA. There's 120 exposure areas in the floodplain for human health. They go from the confluence down to Rising Pond Dam. Um, there's also a number of farm areas that are evaluated separately, and there's also ecological habitat areas that are evaluated um, appropriately for the species that we're looking at. Um, it's a, this is just a figure, an example uh, from actually, I believe, EPA's risk assessment showing the different human health exposure areas in the floodplain from the confluence to New Lenox and New Lenox down to Woods Pond Dam. There's a, about 60 or a little over, probably 90 actually in this reach, including the sub areas. But you can see EPA divided the floodplain into these different areas, made some assumptions about what was appropriate or potential use in those areas and then did the risk assessment based on those. Our evaluation is really just doing the same thing in reverse based on the same areas and the same calculations that EPA did. Similarly, this is a uh, diagram of the same area, the first 10 mile reach, showing the vernal pools. Vernal pools are one of the things we look at for amphibians and amphibian protection, um, ecological IMPGs that are appropriate for that. There's a 66 vernal pools in this 10 mile reach, covering an area of about 34 acres. So it's a pretty significant number of vernal pools and area in this reach that we're going to be looking at. <coughs> This is a summary matrix of the seven alternatives, going from the zero, no action alternative, FP1, and then progressively having more removal, and we'll walk through what these actually are, but walk more removal from 17,000 all the way up to 570,000 cubic yards. Just to, This is only now the floodplain again, uh, just to reiterate that. The area of removal ranges from 11 acres, progressively goes up until it jumps up to about 350 acres of the floodplain um, in FP7. And the time to implement ranges from one to 22 years based on our assumptions about how fast this work could be conducted. Although if it's, the note at the bottom explains, if it's tied to a sediment or paired with a sediment alternative or sediment remedy, um, it's possible that the sediment remedy would take longer and they'd be uh, conducted simultaneously. This is a di the same diagram we used for the sediments, but it's now showing the floodplain soil work the floodplain, the river is obviously in here in blue. The floodplain greater than 1 ppm is in the gray shaded area. Uh, the area in that gray shaded area within the first 10 mile reach is about 834 acres, I believe. And so we'll uh, be showing both the vernal pools, which are in the darker blue, you see in certain spots here, the 1 ppm isoplastic gray. And then as we go through the different alternatives, our preliminary evaluation of how much removal would be conducted and where it would be conducted will uh, appear in brown to, to simulate or show the area subject to removal. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of explaining about what the alternative is. Floodplain alternative two is meeting the 10 to the minus four, so the one in 10,000 excess cancer risk in the floodplain 
and the non-cancer uh, level is appropriate in this 10 mile reach. Um, in order to do that at 17,000 yards of removal over about 11 acres, you see there's some brown, a couple brown areas up here, a couple up near uh, the confluence, and a couple below the Lenox Road, it looks like, and not much else. Um, but that's being the most, or the least conservative end of the range in the EPA cancer risk range, and there's also no additional removal specifically targeted for ecological receptors. Going to floodplain alternative three, this was targeted meaning 10 to the minus fourth, or one in 10,000 excess cancers in the whole floodplain, and in certain what's called frequent use areas and farm areas in the floodplain, we do the, we'd go up another level to the more conservative 10 to the minus fifth, which is in the middle of the range in EPA's risk range also meet the non-cancer level and target some removal to achieve uh, ecological IMPGs. This <coughs> would involve about 60,000 yards of removal over an area of about 38 acres. Floodplain four, now we're meeting the mid-range of the cancer risk range, 10 to the minus fifth or one in 100,000. 1XX cancer in 100,000, also meaning the non-cancer in the upper bound eco. We're not, we're not looking at about 100,000 cubic yards over 62 acres. And you can see the brown areas are starting to show up in more areas. <coughs> Obviously, this is the higher concentration uh, floodplain soils that would be targeted for removal under these alternatives. <coughs> and floodplain five is the first of the threshold alternatives. So this is removal of all soil greater than 50 in the top foot within this 10 mile reach. Again, it's about the similar volume to Fubton 400,000 cubic yards, 62 acres. And we'll be looking at how effective that was in the evaluation that's coming up. Okay, floodplain six, this is the second threshold alternative. Removal of soils in the top foot above 25 parts per million. <clears throat> now we've jumped up from about 100,000 to three, a little over 300,000 cubic yards, almost 200 acres of removal, obviously there's quite a bit more brown areas that are targeted here under the scenario to remove uh, soils greater than 25 in the top foot. And then floodplain seven, the last alternative, is meeting the one in one million excess cancer, 10 to the minus six, meeting the, you know, the non-cancer level. Some of the 10 to the minus six IMPGs are actually below the residential cleanup standard in Massachusetts of two ppm. So in those cases we truncate uh, that number at 2 ppm, since um, 2 ppm in the state is, is um, essentially for unrestricted use, so there's no um, real sense in going below that, we didn't think. Also achieving the lower bound IMPGs, we've now jumped up to about 570,000 cubic yards of soil over 350 acres. Uh, a project which we estimate would take about 22 years by itself. And I'm going to let Stu go through the evaluation, uh, similar to the sediment. Thanks, Andy. And again, I guess I'll remind you that the fact sheet has on page six a summary of the alternatives that Andy just ran, ran through, as well as some of the, some of the uh, overall summaries on removal volumes and areas of removal, which if you have in front of you, when you see the, the FP numbers flash up, you can we look down and remind yourself what they are. Um, as I did with the sediments, I'm going to go through a number of the criteria here that I think provide some distinctions um, and sort of summarize and compare the alternatives. Uh, starting with control of sources of releases, um, the floodplain soils, unlike the sediments, are not a significant source of PCBs to the river. The floodplain is generally flat, it's well vegetated, and it's more depositional in nature. And Basically, looking at EPA's model, it indicates that the contribution of PCBs from the floodplain to the river are insignificant. Um, however, during implementation of some of these removal alternatives, we'll have areas uh, that are open during excavation, and while those can and would be protected, um, there is a potential for migration of materials in that open excavation back to the river or someplace else on the floodplain and giving consideration to those alternatives like FB6 and FB7 where you're removing you know, upwards of a couple hundred thousand yards of material uh, are more apt to have, are going to have the greatest potential for releases. 
long-term reliability and effectiveness, I guess first considering the magnitude of residual risk. Uh, unlike the sediment alternatives where we assembled some alternatives and ran the model to see where they were going to go, these were developed based on the IMPGs. So for those alternatives that Andy mentioned where, I, where we have done removal to achieve 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 5th, uh, you're going to have that level of reduction. And for those where we're, where we're actually targeting some IMPG range, uh, they're more apt to provide reduction in residual risk than those that are just going for the concentrations like 50 and 25. Um, uh, for those PCB concentrate, PCBs that remain in depth, uh, institutional controls would need to be in place to provide long-term protection. Uh, as far as adequacy and reliability, uh, the techniques we're talking about, basically using standard construction equipment to remove soils, uh, and take them off site and then to bring material back on are fairly well established. Um, I guess a, a bit of a distinguishing factor though from a, a, a reliability perspective is for those larger alternatives like FP6 that are removing 315,000 yards over 194 acres of floodplain and FP7 that's 570,000 yards. Um, Given sort of the complex mix of habitats here, there's not we have not identified other sites like this where such extensive uh, removal and restoration has occurred, and there's certainly some uncertainty on the ability to be able to, to restore this to the conditions that are out there now if we were to implement them. Um, and for potential long-term adverse impacts, just as we saw with the sediments, if you're going to do removal out there, you're going to expect some sort of long-term impacts that are going to occur. Uh, the larger the removal activities, the greater the potential for those long-term impacts. Um, uh, some of the uh, concerns, I guess the particular concerns we would have would be impacts, impacts to the upland forest areas, the loss of mature trees. Uh, some, of the, some of the forests out there have trees that I've been told would take 50 to 75 years to reach their functional level. And to take those down, large areas of those are going to have a long time period before they, they get back to that level and they can support the biota that currently lives in them. And I guess a greater uncertainty is the ability to restore some of the wetlands. And for the alternatives, some of the larger alternatives uh, would include removing, uh, you know, 100 plus acres of wetlands from the floodplain. And given sort of the sensitive nature of the, the wetlands, they're they're, they're more difficult to restore, and particularly the vernal pools, which a number of those would be removed uh, with some of these alternatives. Short-term impacts, again, these are impacts that would occur during the actual implementation. Uh, they're somewhat similar with those mentioned for the sediments. Um, with, with these alternatives, they're going to last for the duration of the project, which runs with FP2, which would take one year to implement, up to 22 years if you were to implement FP7. Um, impacts to the environment, um, obviously if you're removing the plants and you're disturbing the wildlife habitat that lives there during that process, they need to find another place to go. Um, as the alternatives get, hard, get larger, it's harder for those organisms to find places where there's sufficient habitat to support them. Um, the habitat type subject to this removal range, as we've said, from, from 11 to 350 acres. And similar to the sediment removal alternatives, we would need to establish staging areas and access roads to get in there. And for those areas, you would have similar short-term impacts. And for the alternatives we're looking at, they range in total from anywhere from nine acres of roadway and staging areas to implement FP2 up to 48 acres to implement FP7. Short-term impacts to the community. Uh, recreational use of those floodplain areas cannot occur while, this, while these alternatives are occurring. And as we saw with the sediment alternatives, to bring in the, the backfill and the restoration materials to fill in those areas that are excavated, there's going to be an increased number of trucks and associated noise and emissions with those. And you know the numbers we have here are just bringing the material in, ranging anywhere from a couple thousand truck trips to support FB2 up to uh, around 66 or 67,000 truck trips if we were to implement FP7. Uh, considering now uh, human health, um, all the alternatives achieve PCB levels that are within EPA's cancer risk range um, in all the sediment exposure areas. Remember, a number of these by design were set up to do that. Um, I guess in more specifics, FP3, which was targeting the 10 to the minus 4, 
Uh, also achieves 10 to the minus fifth in about 75% of the areas, including the frequent use areas. FP4 and FP6 also achieve 10 to the minus fifth. FP4 was designed to do that. Uh, in all uh, exposure areas, FP6, which is removal of materials greater than 25, would also do so. FP5 achieves 10 to the minus fifth in about 75% of the areas, and FP7 achieves 10 to the minus six by design or two parts per million in all the areas. Um, FP2, FP3, and FP4 and 7 achieve EPAs, non-cancer IMPGs in all the areas. And FP5 and 6, which again were the achieving a threshold concentration do so in about 94% of the areas. Uh, with regard to the environment, FPs 3, 4, and 5 provide overall protection. FP2, if you recall, is did not include a component of achieving ecolog ecological uh, thresholds, but it did in some areas. FP6 and 7 meet most of the IMPGs, but uh, in our opinion, cause a significant amount of harm if they were implemented for some of the reasons I mentioned a few minutes ago. To give some of the specifics here, FP2 would achieve levels of the IMPG range for the shrews and the insect-eating birds in most of the areas, but generally not for amphibians or mink. By the way, this is general here because each of these uh, ecological receptors the floodplain is broken up into a, a number of different exposure areas. There's different numbers for each, so we, I mean, we've kept this general. The, the statistics are, are laid out in the report. FP3 and FP4 achieves uh, uh, the ranges for, for the shrews and the amphibians in all the areas, and insect-eating birds or wood ducks in most of the areas, and mink in some circumstances. FP5 and FP6 achieve levels within the IMPG range for the shrews and the wood duck, in most or all areas in mink in some of the areas, but uh, the amphibians only in 30 to 40 percent of the areas. Uh, however, FP6 would cause substantial, as I mentioned, adverse impacts to the environment, including the forest and the wetlands, over 194 acres, resulting in an, an overall net negative impact on the environment. And FP7, although it achieves uh, nearly all the ecological IMPGs, would cause similar widespread extensive damage. So to, to wrap up the floodplain alternatives, uh, G believes that FP3 is best suited to meet the general standards of the permit based on consideration of the balancing factors of those last six factors. The main reasons are that FP3 achieves the floodplain soil levels with an EPA's risk range for protection of human health in all the areas of the floodplain including uh, achieving 10 to the minus fifth in 75% of the areas and, and 10 to the minus fifth in the frequently used areas. It achieves the levels within all the ecological IFPG ranges for most of the wildlife groups and significantly reduces PCB exposure for those groups. And it causes less overall damage into the environment and less disruption than alternatives FP4 through FP7 with fewer concerns over the ability to restore or implement and lower costs. Okay, that, that takes care of it for the floodplain. We're now gonna move on to the treatment and disposal alternatives, which is the last piece here. Um, basically, we've now that we've gone through the floodplain soils and the sediments, We've run through bringing the material out of the holes and placing it someplace. For that material to get removed, something needs to happen with it. And when we put together the CMS work plan, which we presented last year, we looked at an array of different alternatives for disposing materials as well as... A couple of questions. Okay. Questions on the floodplain? Well, I'm sorry too because uh, I think the, the first order of business would have been to make this evening open-ended rather than to um, ask for a specific time limit where we all had to be thrown out. I'm sorry that's happening. Um, in any case, um, we've been told as far as uh, taking <clears throat> sediment out of the river and treatment of the floodplain uh, sediment that um, the um, most invasive scenarios required 22 and 50 some odd years respectively of work in order to accomplish them. 
And as you're, you're saying that, I'm thinking, well, you know, what if, what if I ask my son to move a pile of sand from one place in my yard to another? And if he was smart, the first thing he'd ask me was, can I use a shovel? And I'd say, well, yeah, you can use a shovel. And then he'd say, can I use a bigger shovel? Um, I've got other things to do, my homework, whatever. So I don't know how you're arriving at that 51 years or 22 years. I mean, those, they seem arbitrary because depending on the number of men, the number of machines, the number of um, sources of um, entry that you simultaneously or consecutively decided to, uh, to uh, move on, um, I'm thinking those numbers actually could be quite fluid. In fact, the original assessment for how long the first two miles were going to take, or the first half mile was going to take, um, varied considerably uh, from the actual number of years or months that it took. So I'd like some clarification as to how you come up with these numbers. Okay, and I, I guess I'll point out, I'm not going to go into the details here. They're in the report. I'll answer as best I can. But I'll point out something Andy highlighted before. The first two miles of the river, which were done by EPA and by GE, took seven years. Okay, and if you, for those of you that lived in this town, there wasn't a lot of downtime. It's, the river's small. You've got to contain and control flows. We've set these things up so that when we are doing work, for instance, in the dry in 5A, we do it in a manner that reduces the potential for releases if there's an overtopping event. And in doing this work, and as the model has been set up, the plan is to go from upstream to downstream. If we were to go down to Woods Pond and do some remediation before we got to that point, the model showing us that you've got kind of continued transport port load in the water column and it's going to become recontaminated. So we're constrained by the by the access limitations to the river as well as the, the conditions of the river itself. With regard to the production rates, um, this was something that, that EPA requested before we ran the model that we would sit down and present to them, which we did. It's documented in the report and we got concurrence from them before we hit the go button on the model that what we were assuming for production rates for the various technologies that were implemented were acceptable to them. As, and with regard to the floodplain soils, while you're right, you can use bigger equipment, the same thing applies. The, while, we're, while, while we review these separately, when we do this work, I don't think the plan is to, do, to, to go do floodplain soils down by Woods Pond when we're doing remediation work upstream because, as I pointed out, the floodplain is depositional and we want to minimize recontamination of those areas. So we will luckily, likely do concurrently any work that's selected in the floodplain with the river from upstream to downstream. Okay, um, so I guess as I pointed out, in the uh, CMS work plan, we reviewed an array of alternatives for disposition and treatment. Uh, after screening through those, using the process that Andy had mentioned uh, earlier, we, we selected five disposition and treatment alternatives to consider in detail and comparative evaluation in the CMS report. Uh, the disposition alternatives that are considered include uh, off-site disposal in a permitted landfill, uh, local disposal in what's called a confined disposal facility, which I'll describe to you and show you a, a, sort of a schematic of in a minute, and uh, lastly, local disposal in an upland disposal facility. And with regard to treatment for those materials that are removed, we considered uh, what's known as chemical extraction and also something known as thermal uh, desorption, which I will describe here as well. <coughs> Okay, we're going to go through these one at a time. Um, Off-site disposal in a permitted landfill, basically to remove materials are the water is necessary so that they're roadworthy, put in trucks, which was an assumption we made for purposes of the CMS, and they're transported over public roads to a landfill. Um, land, different landfills are designed to take different materials based on PCB concentrations. To the extent we could, we would segregate the materials so that it was placed in the appropriate landfills. Uh, the volume range that we considered here, remember we've got floodplain soil alternatives and sediment alternatives combined, um, which we're bringing together here now. And if you were to take the, the smaller sediment and floodplain alternatives and combine them, you get about 185,000 yards. And if you were to take the larger ones, which would be set 8 and, and FP7, you'd be at about 2.8 million yards. So we've considered the applicability of each of these based on that range of volumes. And, and we've costed it as well, which you'll see in a few minutes. Uh, primary considerations given during this evaluation process, uh, basically recognizing that 
placement in an off-site landfill eliminates the potential for future release and transport of those materials back into the river and floodplain, we've taken them off-site. So that, that control of source releases doesn't become an issue with this alternative. Uh, landfills are commonly used, the most common, commonly used uh, technique for sediments to date anyways. Regulatory requirements exist for, for landfill design, operation, and monitoring, which would ensure long-term effectiveness and reliability. And the one concern that we have here, given the time frame to implement these, is an uncertainty regarding the availability of uh, landfill capacity in the future. We contacted a number of different landfills in the area and outside of the area, and they don't have a forecast that goes out 51 years. So that's something that would need to be considered if this was selected. Potential short-term risks, uh, as I pointed out before, uh, the truck trips before, we're bringing the clean material in. In this particular case, we're taking the removed material off. We're looking now at an additional, in this case, 211, uh, 211,800 trucks for the upper range here, if you were to implement FD7 uh, and set 8 and you would have the, the associated noise and emissions and traffic accidents with that. Okay, the second disposition alternative was the confined disposal facility. Uh, in essence, what would happen here is we would construct a containment area within the waterway someplace in close proximity to an area where we would be hydraulically, uh, like using a vacuum cleaner to extract the sediments. We would pump them into that area. Uh, there's some fairly standard design uh, manuals out there for these. And the way this was, would work is as the sediments are pumped in, they would be dewatered. The water would pass through a, a, uh, a filter berm and would be and would collect in a perimeter di ditch. Uh, the PCBs would be contained inside, the water would be released, and over time the material would consolidate and we would cover it. Uh, for purposes of the CMS, we selected four locations to evaluate for potential CDF construction. Uh, three of those locations were actually in backwater areas that are just upstream of Woods Pond, and the fourth location was, was the deep water area of Woods Pond itself. And it, to, to, I guess to reflect back on a detail that you may have missed, uh, as these alternatives get larger in size, particularly for sets six, seven, and eight, the amount of sediment that we would be removing from this reach of the river, uh, both in depth and in extent, is very significant. And another technique that could be used, which hasn't been used yet on the Housatonic, would be to hydraulically dredge this material. And that's why we've considered it for these materials in some of those larger alternatives. Okay, so similar to what I did with the, uh, the off-site landfill, these, some of the primary assumptions, obviously we need permanent access to the locations where we would construct those. Um, it really only applies to hydraulically dredged sediment, and in, in the CMS we only considered it for hydraulically dredged sediment in 6, 7, and 8, and reaches 5C and 5, 5D in Woods Pond, uh, in part because there were locations where you could construct these things nearby. And off-site disposal, since we're only dealing with the sediments that are in those reaches, if you were to select one of these alternatives, materials that would be dredged, say, below Woods Pond Dam, or up in reaches 5A and B would have to go somewhere, and we assumed, for purposes of making a complete alternative, that that material would go off-site for disposal. Um, some of the primary considerations in evaluating it, uh, this alternative would minimize the potential for future release and transport of those materials to the river or the floodplain. However, there's more, a more likely chance that it would occur than with some of the other disposition alternatives, uh, in part because of where it's constructed. The technology has been demonstrated to be effective and reliable. It's been used at other sites. There's, as I said before, there's a number of engineering manuals that exist and, and information available for design, operation, and long-term management to provide long-term effectiveness. Um, some of the downsides, it's gonna, it's gonna result in a permanent loss of any aquatic habitat in, in the areas where you construct it. And if these mounds extend some distance out of the water, which even the volumes we had in those areas was around four feet above the current water elevation in those, in those spots, uh, you're likely gonna have some potential flood storage capacity issues during a high storm event that would need to be mitigated or, concerned, or considered rather. Potential short-term risks, as I said, during filling, the theory is that the water 
filter the, the burns filter out the solids and that's where the PCBs are but there's the possibility that it's not going to work properly and you could have a release of PCBs to the, to the surface water as well as to the air during the process and the other concern would be since given it's those locations that during a high storm event you may have damage from ice or high water to the structure itself that could release the material back to the river. Okay, the third disposition alternative we looked at is construction and placement of material in an upland disposal facility. Uh, in essence, what we would do is find a location somewhere near the river, uh, and, for, and the assumption has been that it would be outside of the 100-year floodplain, but in close proximity to the river. The material would be dewatered adequately so that you could truck the material to here, place it, uh, and it would be placed in a structure that has uh, an impermeable liner and impermeable cover, similar to what you would see with an off-site disposal facility uh, for, for a permanent disposition. Uh, some of the assumptions, similar to what we saw with the CDF, you'd have to have permanent access and a suitable location would have to be identified. Uh, we have not done that at this point. Removal materials would need to be dewatered, loaded into trucks and transported to the upland disposal facility. Um, some of the considerations when we were comparing these, uh, a location and design uh, uh, effectively would prevent future release and transport of this material back to the river. Again, the plan is to put this outside of the 100-year floodplain, so unlike the CDF you just saw, the material while near the river is going to be in a place where it, where, where it will not be able to impact the river in the future. Um, these have been constructed at other sites before, other PCB sites. You know, it's basically it's similar to the construction of, a, of the off-site facilities. There's design, operation, and monitoring requirements that would be put in place to ensure long-term effectiveness and reliability. Um, any short or long-term impacts that you might see to the area where you construct it could be minimized by careful selection of a location that doesn't have a lot of these sensitive habitats. And uh, unlike some of the al other alternatives, uh, you know, you're not going to have the short-term impacts associated with truck traffic because the plan here is to just use either uh, roads constructed or some means of transporting it so you're not so you're minimizing any time or travel on uh, local highways okay I'm now going to move into the two and we're starting to wind down here the two uh, treatment technologies that we looked at I mentioned earlier the first one is called chemical extraction uh, in essence Chemical extraction, in a nutshell, involves taking some sort of a solvent or a surfactant or some chemical that you would mix with the, with the sediments or the soils. That, that would preferentially extract the PCBs out of the soils or the sediments. And the goal would be to either reduce, to try to reduce the concentrations to a point where possibly you could reuse the material or if not, uh, change its ultimate disposition. Um, in this particular case, uh, because there's not a lot of uh, full-scale projects where this sort of thing has been implemented, the EPA asked that we do a bench scale treatability study, which was done in, on GE's plant site uh, for uh, several months ago. And after looking at about 14 different vendors that claim to offer this, uh, we selected a vendor uh, known as Biogenesis. Um, and what I've done here is try, I've dumbed down quite a bit their process. They have a very elaborate process to handle this material and try to get the PCBs out of it. Uh, and if you are interested in more details, uh, their final report is actually in the appendix to our report. Uh, but I guess in, in essence, the sediment and floodplain soils uh, were, would be removed. Chemical addition and mixing would occur. This process uh, tends to work through significant agitation using water and air to try to knock out some of the naturally occurring organics as well as uh, break up the solids so that there's surface area for these for the surfactants to to allow the PCBs to be removed they go through a what's called a cavitation and an oxidation chamber so they actually have a a uh, step in here using hydrogen peroxide where when the PCBs are removed you can actually attempt to destroy them and then for the material, the wastewater that's left over, that would be disposed as well as the sludge. And you would look at the treated material and determine what its ultimate end use would be. This slide gives a, a brief summary of the results. What we did was, we, recognizing there's different types of material in the river, we went out and collected three different sam samples from three different locations. 
We collected a coarse grain sediment in the upper reach, up around 5A. Uh, we, the second sample was more of a fine grain sample, which we obtained from Woods Pond. And then we also grabbed a representative a floodplain soil sample for testing. Um, when performing this process, I showed you the, the uh, schematic. Uh, one of the things they're able to do is to run the material through their system. And, it, and what they do is they'll run through different grain sizes, so they'll break it up into pieces, run it through their system. They have the capability of, of recycling it and seeing what happens after multiple treatment cycles to the PCB concentrations. And this is a fairly uh, broad overview of the results of all the combined studies. Before treatment, the concentrations in those three samples range from 45 to 177 parts per million. After the first treatment cycle, they reduced the concentrations down to seven, for, ranging from seven to 48. And after the third treatment cycle, down to four to 22. And I, although the, the second cycle isn't on here, we basically, the results are fairly comparable to this. We saw sort of a plateauing off of the, uh, of the uh, reduction in PCBs in the material after multiple cycles. Um, Looking at these concentrations here now, we used this to decide how we were going to handle the, the uh, biogenesis materials after they were treated in the CMS. And because we didn't get them down to a level that would allow sort of unrestricted use or exposure to, uh, for in the CMS we've assumed that material after it went through the treatment system would be disposed of off-site. So again, the, the process assumptions, biogenesis, would construct uh, their facility outside the 100-year floodplain, so we don't have to worry about recontamination, although it's a fairly minimal potential here. In some structure, uh, in close proximity to the river, all the treated solids would be disposed of afterwards in an off-site solid waste landfill. Uh, I guess to go back to the, the details of, those, of the data, um, the concentrations, as you saw, were above 50 before, and when they were brought back together, they were less than 50, so the assumption is that we can we can take those into a solid waste rather than a Tosca landfill. I guess with one thing that would need to be worked out, the samples, the samples were broken up into pieces, and those pieces that were analyzed, several of them were above 50 parts per million. So if we were able to change the ultimate destination of this material, we'd need approval to, to take the greater than 50, combine it to make a less than 50 final concentration. Um, considerations that were given when we evaluated it, uh, unlike the alternatives on their own with removal, in this particular case, treatment would reduce the toxicity, mobility, and volume of the PCBs. Uh, but as I noted, based on the, the bench study results, they would still require disposal and landfill. Uh, there are uncertainties regarding the effectiveness and rel reliability uh, when applied full scale. There is no precedence using chemical extraction at other sites of this magnitude with similar ranges of concentrations. Um, as I mentioned briefly, the extent to which the PCB levels in the sediments and soils can be reduced and the effect that may have on disposal is, is uncertain at this time. And as one would expect to run a uh, system like this, if you were to select FP7 and set 8 for 51 years, you can expect equipment failure and downtime. Um, some of the potential short-term risks would be, in this case, trucking the material off-site after it's treated and any associated noise and emissions and any releases or spills that might occur for, with chemicals or whatever at the facility while it's operating. And the... We're trying to get through this section, Dono. Can you, can, can you just hold it until we get finished with the treatment alternatives? I'd like to talk to I know, I know. Um, let's get through this. Uh, oh, we're going to have a vote on this. I'm sorry. Let's do that. Let's have a vote on it. Okay, well, I, I mean, I'm happy to sit down if everybody wants to go on with the presentation. I just feel I have a question. Actually, it's not a question because I did a certain amount of analysis on this particular section of your report. It's section 7, I believe. And um, I actually came up with a, a slightly different, using your numbers, I came up with a very different interpretation. First of all, I thought it was a um, it, it, it was somewhat disingenuous to um, lump all of the tests and all of the runs together because, in fact, biogenesis uh, and I'm assuming there are other treatment technologies that could do it, but this one that you tested was quite effective in the lower level PCBs, taking it down and actually by a magnitude, one order of magnitude, which means that in many cases 
the PCBs that you're going to otherwise bury in different scenarios, the first three scenarios, all of that stuff that's under 50 parts per million, and I'm assuming that there is a great deal of it, um, if treated with three passes, and that biogenesis is successful in three passes of taking it down to a, a, a single order of magnitude, that would be at five parts per million or less. Something between 30 and 50 parts per million would be between three and five parts per million. What happens if there was another pass? It's almost at the threshold where that sediment is usable for clean or to be able to reuse it on site in place of the river. And at that point, your costs are dramatically decreased by 50%, assuming that 50% of your sediment that you're treating is, in fact, under the 50 part per million threshold. I'd be, you know, I'd be happy to go through with this with you in detail later. But all I can say is, if anybody else in the audience is interested, I'll be happy to show you my analysis later. This is a complete one-sided, one vision kind of presentation. It does not, in fact, reflect the true potential of this particular remedial technology. Okay, I, I mean, I'll just say that I disagree. Uh, as Beno pointed out, there we actually have hundreds of samples that I could have presented here, but in the essence of time, I've put together, basically I've, I've summarized the data. I mentioned that to begin with. The complete report is in the appendix here, and I'd be glad to talk about it in further detail afterwards as well. Um, so moving on to the final treatment technology here, thermal treatment, basically, I guess in a nutshell, and this is a picture of it being used at a particular site on soils. The material's put into some sort of a container, the material's heated, the PCB concentrations basically are volatilized to the air, and that, that air is passed through some sort of a, a scrubber where the, where the gas stream condenses the PCBs into, into some uh, a, a liquid form where it can be treated or disposed. This technology, by the way, has, there's enough small scale examples of it where we were, we were not asked and did not really feel we needed to do a treatability study to look at it and see at, a, at this level. Okay, uh, some of the process assumptions, some of the assumptions we had. Thermal desorption uh, would be constructed, the facility like with uh, the biogenesis or chemical extraction would be constructed in close proximity to the river, but outside the 100 year floodplain. Uh, a portion of those treated materials would be reused. We took a look at uh, the application of this at a number of sites, mostly floodplain soils, and uh, they were consistently achieving one or two or less parts per million. So we made assumptions for purposes of the CMS that for those areas where we did removal in the floodplain, we would take treated material and, and we would have to amend it with organics because you're burning the organics off when you do it and then place it back in the floodplain. We did not assume that that treated material could be used to replace the sediments that are removed. There's no precedence for this for that at this point in time. And uh, I guess those are the assumptions that we made and you'll see cost for in a minute. Some of the considerations when we screened it, again, this is a treatment technology. It would reduce the toxicity, mobility, and volume of PCBs in the treated material. But since we're not able to sediments back after we treatment, there's some component that would need to go off-site for disposal. Um, there is no precedence for sites of this size. Most of them are you know, several thousand yards. Um, some of the complications that have been noted with other studies is when material has high moisture content, uh, and if you think about it, the first step here is to drive the water off before you get it in there. So there's a cost and a, and a step to dry it out and high organic contents and a high percentage of fine grain materials causes some complications with the process itself. Um, another thing noted is that um, in burning off the organics, it can increase the toxicity and mobility of, of metals. Those metals that are bound to the organics, the organics are gone now, so now this material is more leachable than it was before for metals. And uh, also noted is with PCBs, sometimes if there's incomplete combustion, you can get formation of dioxins and furans. Um, potential short-term impacts, again, some amount of this material's got to go off-site. Uh, for the upper alternative we considered, it would be on the order of 190,600 truck trips, and there's always the potential, given the time frame we're doing this, for releases or spills. And again, a quick, I guess a quick, quick chart with trucks here, um, and this covers sort of the range. Um, 
for alternatives uh, TD1 and TD4, where the materials going off site, all the materials got to go off site. We're, we're up over 200,000 trucks. Uh, TD5A, which which is an this is the alternative where we assume some reuse of the material since less has to go off. We're at about 160,000 trucks, and where on the extreme event we're not able to take any material and reuse it. Everything's got to go off. There's a bit less because when you run it through the thermal treatment unit, there's some of the materials burn and you've got a reduction in mass. So to, to sort of wrap these all together, TD1 uh, protects health and the environment through off-site disposal of sediments and soils. As I mentioned, there are some uncertainties regarding future off-site disposal capacity. Uh, and, you know, for those alternatives, if we were to select them that extend for a long period of time. TD2 protects health and the environment through placement of that that, that material in reaches uh, 5C and 6 into the CDF, but uh, it would basically permanently disrupt, uh, it would not, I'm sorry, it would not provide a disposition location for the remaining materials. It would be part of those alternatives. Um, you have the potential for releases during and after filling, and it could, re could create a problem with flood storage capacity. TD3 protects health and the environment through disposition of the material in a local engineered landfill with a liner cover and leachate collection system, similar to what you would see for TD1. It effectively isolates the sediments and the soils from people and wildlife. Uh, TD4 uh, protects health and the environment through treatment with chemical extraction, with off-site disposal of some of the treated material. Some of the downsides are that, again, the process has not been operated at a size that would be likely uh, that we would see with the alternatives we've got here and their treatability study indicates that the process does not consistently reduce the PCD levels or sufficiently for reuse on site. Uh, as you would see with anything running upwards of 51 years, you can expect potential operational problems and uh, it's going to require handling and treatment of a large volume of wastewater. And finally for TD5, um, it would also provide protection of human health and the environment through treatment with potential on-site reuse for some of the material as backfill in the floodplain and off-site of the rest of the material. Uh, there's very limited precedence for use on sediments, due in part, as I mentioned, at the time of cost to drive the water out of the materials. Uh, use at other sites has mainly been on soils and smaller volumes. And the reliability of the process over the long term, there's just not precedence to uh, to, to, to compare this to. So, wrapping these together, the overall conclusion, GE believes the TD3 disposal in local uh, upland landfill facility is best suited to meet the performance evaluation criteria for the following main reasons. It permanently isolates the PCB containing sediments and soils from human and wildlife. There's a high degree of reliability and implementability compared to the other alternatives. There's no substantial long-term or short-term adverse impacts, and it's the most cost-effective of the treatment disposition alternatives. We've got just a few more charts. Okay, these, by the way, these next couple of charts, I believe, are in your fact sheet. On page seven, so um, basically what we did, we've, if you recall here quickly, we've screened separately the sediment alternatives, the floodplain alternatives, and then the, for those alternatives, components that have removal, uh, the disposition or treatment of those materials. What we've done now is taken all the combinations that we could put together, and we've developed a cost, and there's two tables in your fact sheet. One would be combining the eight sediment alternatives with the various, where appropriate, the, the uh, five treatment disposition alternatives. And as you can see, there's no cost for sediment alternative one. Set two, uh, if you recall, is monitor natural recovery. So that's the cost we're assuming to run a 30-year monitoring program to assess the effectiveness of monitor natural recovery. And the cost you see down here ranging up to one point, uh, almost $1.4 billion would be the cost just for the sediment and the disposal component. The next table, set up in a similar fashion, looks at the sediment floodplain alternatives and the five treatment disposition alternatives. Again, you know, the cost, no cost for, for FB1 because it's no action. And the costs range, uh, you know, anywhere from, I believe, 15 million up to about $400 million. Next. 
Okay, so in summary, GE believes a combination of FP3, SED3 with local disposal is best suited to meet the permit criteria. It would involve removal of about 167,000 yards of river sediments, over 42 acres uh, from 5A, including the banks, and placement of a six inch cover over an additional 97 acres in, in the uh, lower reach of 5C in Woods Pond. Uh, it would also include removal of 60,000 yards of floodplain soil over 38 acres, disposition of the removal materials in a secured landfill near the river, uh, but outside the 100-year floodplain would occur. The duration would be 10 years, and the estimated cost is $184 million. Z3 provides a large reduction in PCB flowing in the river, as I pointed out earlier, about 94% at Woods Pond Dam and about 87%, 18 miles further down the river at Rising Pond Dam, and the PCB levels in the fish would drop anywhere from 72 to 99% after the, as indicated by the 52-year model run. It achieves reductions in the shortest time, has the least adverse impacts to the environment and local communities and the fewest implementation uncertainties. FP3 achieves uh, PCB levels in the floodplain within the EPA's risk range for human health protection in all the floodplain areas and significantly reduces the wildlife exposure to PCBs um, and results in less damage to the environment and it's less disruptive than, than I've highlighted and you can imagine for uh, FPs 4 through 7. Disposal of the remote materials in a local engineered landfill would permanently isolate those materials from human and ecological exposure and has the highest degree of reliability with no significant adverse impacts. That takes care of it for the presentation. We have, we have three slides that should talk about the process and the fact that EPA is going to make its own assessment about this and then we'll open the floor. So I see, you, I see your hands and it's a very quick um, description of what happens to this proposal. As so many of you, have, some of you have pointed out, this is a one-sided proposal. Yes, it's GE's proposal. Um, Hi, I'm Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Sabersky. I'm the project manager from EPA for Rest of River, and I'm just going to quickly go over the process of what happens after tonight going forward. Um, hopefully, to uh, answer some questions before they come up. First off, as you all probably know, we got the report on Friday, uh, so we're just starting to dig into it with all of our experts from across the country that we have on our team and we will be evaluating the report as well as GE's recommended alternatives. Um, considering those evaluation criteria that Stu went over, the nine criteria that are specified um, in the permit under the consent decree, we will also be evaluating the input that we're going to receive from all of you during our public, um, informal public input process that we have set up that is not a, required under the procedures in the permit but we really do want to hear from you all, so we have added that to the process. We have the ability under the permit to either approve the report as it stands, require conditions for GE to change items in the report, or to disapprove the report, in which case we can actually remand it back to GE to redo, or we could possibly take it back and do it ourselves. So those are the options that are out there under the permit. After we get a final corrective measure study, we will actually be proposing EPA's preferred alternative for a formal public comment period. Um, and after that public comment period closes, we will be finalizing our decision at which time we, under the permit, are required to notify GE of what that final decision is. And there are terms under the permit that allow GE to invoke an informal dispute resolution process with the EPA regional office to try to resolve the differences of opinion at that time. When the dispute resolution has been completed, EPA will issue our final permit modification as well as a response to all of those public comments that were received during that formal public comment period. And at that time, the public and GE have the right to appeal EPA's final decision first to the EPA Environmental Appeals Board down in DC, 
And after completion of that series of appeals, anything they can continue to appeal to the U.S. Appeals Court. After the completion of all appeals and whatever decision is upheld by through the appeals process, the consent decree requires that GE implement and pay for whatever the decision is for Rest of River. Okay, so what's the schedule we're operating under? Um, I mentioned already we got the report on Friday. Uh, we began at the informal public comment period um, on the 22nd. And any comments that are received during this informal public comment period will be put in the administrative record as are any formal public comments. So just to allay people's fears on that. Uh, we originally had proposed a 30-day comment period. And again, we're adding this piece to the process. It's not required. Um, last night, we did re receive a request for an extension of the public comment period, and we are taking that under consideration, and we will get an, um, a message out to folks in the next few days about that extension. Okay, we are, we're holding these two Citizens Coordinating Council meetings to try to get the, um, allow GE to present the materials that are in that corrective measure study. But then I'm also offering what I did back for the corrective measure study proposal, which is if anyone would like to schedule, any organized group would like to schedule a meeting with me, for me not to provide EPA's opinion on the report, but to sit down with you all and answer any factual questions or a answer, um, explain what some of these terms mean or whatever, or what the process is, I am more than happy to do so. And we had a lot of people <coughs> do that during the corrective measure study proposal. So you just need to contact me, and my contact information is on the back of the fact sheet. So, okay, as I said, um, the report, and actually, Andy mentioned, the report is already up on our website. And that is the URL that you can uh, find the report at. Um, if you're interested in the underlying EPA guidance that sort of guides us in selecting contaminated sediment remedies, that's the URL where you can find the current EPA guidance document that um, gives us those guidelines. Uh, the report is physically in existence in all of our information repositories, so if you like to deal with paper, that's where you want to go rather than the electronic copy. Um, and lastly, you can, as I mentioned, schedule a session with me to uh, try to go through some of the terms and answer some questions, factual questions on what's in the report. Um, the opportunities to provide input to the process are, first off, this informal com public comment period that I mentioned. Secondly, there is um, an opportunity for organized groups to submit up to 10 pages of comments to what is called the EPA National Remedy Review Board. And that's an entity that reviews all large remedies for consistency and compliance with EPA guidance. Um, so that it would occur probably in the June time frame, early June time frame, that those comments would need to be pulled together. And that, again, is up to 10 pages. And lastly, there will be the formal public comment period that will be held on EPA's preferred alternative. Um, once we get through all of these other steps. So that's it. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for EPA specifically? Yeah. Okay, we'll go to you. No. Yeah. Okay, can you shout? Yes. <coughs> yeah. the, excuse me. The informal comment period, which is taking place now, uh, can we submit, perhaps by email or whatever, comments to you, or to whom do we submit them? Yes, you'd submit them to me. At the practice? At that. There you go. Yes. Um. Great. Other questions for EPA? Carolyn? Um, just, no. a, just in general, when EPA is reviewing this, and I know you now get back to them, are you limited to the said, you know, for instance, the said one to eight, or can you mix and match some of the, the all, you know, the configuration? That we they can mix and match. Okay. Great. Any other questions for EPA? I just wanted to know if tonight's presentation by General Lenzer, just a yes or no answer, was negotiated in the consent decree for them to present tonight solo. 
No, we requested that they make a presentation. And then, um, now this, the Housatonic River is uh, hybridized superfund site. I'd like to know where in the process, can you go back to your first slide? <coughs> All right. Um, any other questions for Susan? There's one on, yeah, there's one on, on the table. No, there's one there. Uh, where you said that EPA could take over the CMS from away from GE, do the work, and charge GE. Where, where does that all happen? Um, I'm going to let Tim Conway answer both of your questions. <laughs> Can you please use, use the microphones, everybody? Uh, Judy's question was, uh, if you look at the uh, second blue bullet, EPA may approve, conditionally approve, or disapprove the corrective measure study. Judy's question was, where, where, does that, where does the part of the process come up where EPA can take over the project from GE? Let me make sure I got it right, Judy. That, that, G, that EPA can take over the completion of the corrective measure study from GE? Do the work and charge GE. Do the work and charge charge EPA. Um, the second blue bullet allows for EPA, if EPA disapproves the corrective measure study, EPA, one of EPA's options is to uh, for EPA to physically modify the corrective measure study instead of asking GE to do it. So if we disapprove the corrective measure study, we can either uh, disapprove it and tell GE to go back and fix it, or we can disapprove it and physically modify it ourselves. So do they have due process at, at that point to appeal that decision? Uh, they would have the ability to invoke dispute resolution under the permit, but I believe that step is an administrative dispute resolution. They'd have some due process to dispute it to EPA within the regional office at EPA. Thank you. You're Uh, any other questions from the table for EPA first? Is yours EPA? Okay, so I'm coming to you right after you to defer. And then I'm coming to you later, sir. Thank you very much. I'm Peter Defer. I'm the technical advisor for the Housatonic River Initiative. Susan, you probably want Tim to answer this question as well. <laughs> Last summer, GE invoked uh, the dispute resolution option under their permit. And this process anticipates that the same option is available. Are those records part of the administrative record, or are they closed? Are they publicly they're, available? They're all completely publicly available. They're all posted on the website, both GE's dispute letters to us, as well as our responses back to them. OK. <laughs> I'm Tim Gray, uh, director of the River Initiative, and um, I just, uh, this was the question, I have a couple of things to say, but um, this was the question when he was going on about thermal desorption, but I had noticed that constantly through the presentation, uh, they're going truck trips, truck trips, and it's kind of a, a thing to, that I believe to kind of worry the public, like we're going to have these 70,000 truck trips all the time. Well. The railroad runs right alongside the river where this entire cleanup goes. It seems to me that not a truck is going to have to leave the site to go down a public road if they're going to be putting it in railroad cars, cars and uh, hauling it out of here, which is what I believe they're doing on the Hudson River. I think that might be one of the remedies on the Hudson River. So it, it is a doable thing. It's done at other sites. So I um, don't believe that the truck trips have to happen. Um, the other thing is, during, doing the, during the whole process, whenever we got to selection uh, decision factors, not once was there community acceptance. Not once. It was like saying, we have to listen to what you're saying. We you have no chance for community acceptance. We hope that EPA, when they review this, will listen to whether the community is happy with these decisions. Because some decisions were made on the first round when a lot of the people weren't at the table, like putting the PCB dump next to an elementary school, that we found to be just totally unacceptable. And we're hoping that there's a little more will to find out what the community is going to accept, what they would like in their community. 
because it is a, it is a place to live. Um, and I just like to say about cost effectiveness, you know, we don't give a hoot. We want the best cleanup possible, you know? And this first cleanup that cost close to a billion dollars, three quarters of a billion dollars, it didn't even make a blip on your financial screen, GE. You just kept making money during the whole time. And you made so much money on the PCBs in Berkshire County for so many years, it built your company to what it is today. You owe it to this community to come in here and do the best possible cleanup you can. Thank you for being here tonight and for the many years that you've put in uh, trying to help Susan. you got to hold it up. Hi, Susan, I want to thank you for uh, being here tonight and for the many years that you have been uh, help, trying to help citizen, uh, citizens through, through an elaborate and complicated process. I appreciate your presence here tonight. Uh, I, I'm George Oslaki, I live at 169 Pomeroy Avenue, I live mean, uh, close, in close adjacency to the river. And I've been with this process since the very beginning, off and on. And I recall the beginnings of this process. It all began, of course, in Pittsfield. It all began with uh, the uh, direct, regional director of EPA, the secretary of environmental affairs, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the city of Pittsfield, and the uh, possibility that Pittsfield might become a super, a super fun site. And the fears that uh, uh, GE built up in the public there, they had uh, more ads in the Berkshire Eagle uh, to explain the, the goodness of it, that uh, you don't want to be a super fun site. Uh, conspiring with the Chamber of Commerce, of course, to uh, put a short view on the matter, is uh, this would be bad for uh, uh, Pittsfield and the renaissance that we all envisioned for Pittsfield. And uh, uh, lawyers who uh, were conspired with GE to make sure that we would enter into a, a, a consent decree which was never signed by any of the town, with the exception of the city of Pittsfield, which was indeed, uh, they were a party to the, these proceedings that led up to the uh, signing of this consent decree. But to the best of my knowledge, no community was ever invited, that we are, uh, of the smaller communities, which are going to be affected on this particular proposals here uh, to a tremendous extent. And uh, so I think that if you're a citizen here, and particularly a citizen who's coming for the first time, that, uh, I urge you to uh, be as cautious as you might be if you buy a pack of cigarettes and you read that little ad on the side. This could be harmful for your health if you participate in this process. Harmful, but mainly it could be harmful uh, for what you think about the river. This, you're not going to see at the end of the process uh, a river that might, uh, you might remember when you were a young child from a river that Norman Rockwell would have uh, spoken to. You were going to see uh, whatever, it whatever it is, something that is resembling an urban drainage ditch. I mean, that is what Pittsfield ended up with. And I think it, there's a lot of sadness there. But I, uh, I re what I deeply regret in Pittsfield is uh, that we end up with this river that's a ditch. And you try that armor and look at that. Uh, that's not a river. Uh, that's an engineered space. It's engineered by uh, engineers. But it's not the river, OK? And you're going to lose the river in that sense. But I do think you have one thing you can do, is to do the very best for this river. Uh, and I don't think Pittsfield did it. And uh, to say no, and to say, this is our river. This is Lennox's river. This is George Derry's river. This is uh, the river that belongs to Lee. This is the river that belongs to everybody. And that you just won't accept anything short of the very best. And if, uh, I, I don't think you should buy uh, a proposal, uh, uh, a, what is it called, Plan 3 or whatever it is, or what General Electric has put, put out at the table. Of course they're going to put it out. And then I promise you, you will see, once you have to talk about the difficult and horrifying issue of the landfill, that they will put out ads on, on that. They can't do it without it. It's a conspiracy on their part. 
but a demand that they do the very best by the river and uh, uh, more power to it. Uh, if it takes 50 years, God bless, I think it do 50 years to do the right thing. We live in a time of climate change. We live in an opportunity where we have to seize the day and trying to repair this river for generations that have come well beyond us is what we should do. And I urge your friends to uh, ask the selectmen, people in public life, uh, that, to, that they should be involved here and they should be doing the very best. And I thank you so much. Man in the yellow shirt is next. The man in the yellow shirt doesn't have a title. Uh, it doesn't belong to any of these organizations. Uh, I'm Rick Williams. Um, just happened to be a guy whose backyard goes straight down to the river and owns land adjacent to a very large parcel of General Electric owned land adjacent to the river. And I know in your presentation that you uh, showed us a very good map representation of the potential sites for the confined disposal facility around Woods Pond. Um, what are the potential sites for the upland disposal facility that is uh, close to the river but outside the floodplain? Hey Rick, um, at this point, there hasn't been any determination made of a location. I mean, we just put this plan together, did the evaluations. Um, we have started some very preliminary. Uh, evaluations of potential locations, but we've not made any uh, determination of the suitability of anything. Really, our real point on this is until EPA um, reviews our plan and makes comments and either agrees that we should pursue this avenue or not pursue this avenue, um, there really is no plan going forward about a location for the landfill. Does the newly acquired land, I'm uh, Elizabeth Williams, Rick's wife, does that fall in the 100 year floodplain, the two pieces of property that were just recently acquired by GE, bought by GE from George Noble? Right, it, uh, the two pieces of property you're, are, you're referring to are essentially a between or upstream of New Lenox Road and that stretch for people that maybe don't know. Um, they're predominantly in the floodplain, the vast majority of the property is in the floodplain, so we don't anticipate uh, that those would be appropriate for this kind of location. As you mentioned, or as we saw, in the presentation, um, we believe that facility would be outside the 100 year floodplain, so they wouldn't be appropriate for that. Next. Uh, I'm Matt Barnes, the First Regional Planning Commission. I do have one question going back to the earlier part of the presentation. And that's in the sediment analysis of the scouring effects. Um, did that now, for, I mean, rivers are dynamic systems. They tend to move back and forth. The banks move uh, over time. Uh, did that account for that kind of lateral movement as well as just scouring of the, the stream bed itself? Um, I'll answer that question by referring to how the alternatives were set up a lot of the areas that, that lateral migration does occur, and EPA did study this, is in the upper part of the river, um, what's referred to as Ridge 5A, as you've seen through these, these uh, presentations. And in that area, the remedies were uh, designed to have that armor stone, that, that stable material, as well as um, the river banks that are eroding. And, and that's um, the thought there is cutting those river banks back and stabilizing them would, would cut down on that lateral mobility in the river associated with that. Um, next, and then you're next. Uh, I'm Mario DiBartolo. I'm, I'm a river abutter. Um, I'm at 5A between Palm Ryan and Holmes Road Bridge. And uh, one of the slides we talked about, um, we, we both have steep banks and some floodplain on our property. And I'm really concerned about uh, the discussion of cutting down mature trees. And, and touching the steep banks. Um, why would you do that? Uh, these are areas that are scoured. There's no deposits there. Uh, you've done extensive testing there. Why would you even consider disrupting a steep bank that's somewhat fragile? 
mean, for, for purposes of the CMS, we have assumed, we had to assume something. And we've assumed that for all the banks along Reaches 5A, that those would be addressed through some sort of stabilization, which could include some removal. And depending upon what technique we selected, if we were to lay the banks back more in those locations, trees that were in close proximity would have to come out. Of course, if a remedy selected it includes doing this, there will be some sampling during, during pre-design to determine whether those portions of the bank actually have PCBs that could, through some sloughing in the bank, become mobile and fall back into the river. The objective being, as we work our way down through here, we want to make sure along those banks are not places that can be future sources. I understand that. You have areas that, that if you actually start messing with it, you're going to make things worse. If you're growing the project where there's no PCBs, by affecting those steep areas. Well, if, if there's no PCBs there, then, then we will likely not do anything in those locations. Thank you. I'm Valerie Anderson. I live in Pittsfield. Um, and I just want to say that this whole thing is really, really sad because um, I guess the Housatonic River will not be as beautiful and not be able to be enjoyed for the rest of our lives. And um, it's really sad that GE ruined this beautiful resource in Berkshire County. Well, with that said, um, I have part of GE's proposal here about the upland uh, disposal facilities that it's advocating. And uh, the report says that the facility will be designed to hold PCBs over 50 parts per, per million. And I just want to make sure that's right because as I understood it, 50 parts per billion or million <laughs> is a really, really toxic level. And in fact, even our beautiful Hill 78 doesn't have PCBs of 50 parts per billion, million. They were trucked out to Buffalo because 50 parts per million is considered really toxic. And uh, the people who live near these <clears throat> upland storage facilities have every right to be very, very concerned. And I would also like to know, first of all, if 50 parts per billion is, it, per million is contemplated and what your um, site locations are. You said you considered some. I'd like to know what those are. Okay, um, I deal with your first or address your first question first. Um, I think in the CMS when it talks about um, greater than 50 part per million, there's that's a, governed by a different set of regulations. Typically that material, when it's placed in a landfill, has certain requirements such as a liner, um, sometimes UJ collection, there's a set of regulations that govern how that, might, that material might be managed. And so we've made the assumption in the CMS that, that <coughs> the upland uh, disposal facility would have those types of uh, design requirements both underneath it and then when it was actually closed, would have requirements about how the cap would be constructed to be impermeable on top of it, etc. Um, over 50. Yeah, over 50. Um, in addition, I mean, there's been material from over 50 that's been placed in the aligned facility and the GE facility as well, um, aligned uh, on plant consolidation area greater than 50. So, I don't know, it's hard to, you know, I don't really want to say what you comment about greater than 50 is really, really toxic. I mean, it's, very much the similar 49 parts per million or 48 parts per million. I mean, it's, it's really just regulated by a different set of um, uh, regulations by the government, by EPA. And where are those other sites? We really haven't focused on anything. All we really have done is what we said in the presentation was it, it would be outside the 100-year flood plain. It would be somewhere in the vicinity of the river. We haven't made any determination about potential you locations must have like that. About it. <laughs> I think about a lot of I think about a lot of things actually. But, uh, 
Not thinking about where a landfill could be. No. Not until EPA either concurs or disagrees with us on the uh, approach. Thank you, Bill and Chris Cohen. Uh, have been living near the uh, Wusatonic River for the last 38 years. Uh, we're residents of East Atlantic Road in, in Pittsfield. And I'm a fairly recent arrival to this process, but I, I have a very, very broad layman's view after this presentation. And I was reflecting on the uh, advertisement that GE has taken great pride in the new innovations it's brought to uh, thermal energy and, and wind energy. That's not my son. Um, we're not coordinated here. But seriously, GE takes great pride in that technological edge and how it's improving the life in, for so many people in other nations. And it seems to me, as I look at the plan, it is it's about as low tech as you could find. It's to dig up the mud, to cover it with rocks or sand, put it in a truck or up to 50,000 trucks for plan three, and put it someplace in Berkshire County, apparently. And both chemical extraction, thermal uh, desorption, or any of the other more high-end, more high-tech plants seem to have been dismissed. Um, I would strongly urge GE to consider better ways of dealing with this other than the very, very low tech, in which, in order to make it more effective as you go up the scale of plants, it becomes more invasive and more disruptive to people around the river. And it seems to say the, you know, this is what you want, and this is what you're going to have to live with. And, and now I'm just telling you that's the sense I have after this presentation. Um, please consider GE, the quality of life in Berkshire County, as much as you stole, stole the virtues and quality of life in those other nations that you want to improve. Finally, if I were a cynic, I would say, boy, if you want to create a political lightning rod which will cause this project to not go forward very far, very fast, talk about building a dump like the one in Allen, outside the Allendale School and putting it somewhere in Berkshire County, you can be sure this will be held up in litigation for, for years. My one question is, you did purchase three farms along the river, I'm thinking about 5A and 5B, and uh, you have said it's in the floodplains and you have no particular plans for it. Um, are you held, GE, to the same level of responsibility for cleaning up those areas as you would for any other areas along the river? Because they are in floodplains and they also have uh, some steep bankings as well. The, uh, the answer to that is yes, it would be treat, you know, treated as a recreational type property with uh, appropriate cleanup standards. Uh, I was seeing these percolation tests I was doing. Told me of a uh, landfill, probably back then it was called a dump in Richmond, that had an old abandoned mine shaft on the property, and he informed me that some barrels of transformer oil with PCBs in them were uh, deposited down that mine shaft. And this area is right above West Dockers Line, and right below that area, Furness Hill Road and Cone Hill Road area in Richmond and West Dockers Mass is a kind of a water recharge area or even an aquifer, which supplies part of West Dockers with their uh, water supply for the town. I told an elected official down that area about this some years ago. He never brought it forward. I ever seen any mention made any studies on this whole problem, cleaning up the floodplain of the Wisconsin River. Uh, what would you have for plans for addressing a situation like that? I think what I would recommend is you talk to Kim Conway or Susan or Dean from EPA and explain what you know and and let them uh, address it appropriately. Oh, sorry. Yeah, probably the Mass DEP. Uh, given, sorry, it's not part of the. Uh, Susan helped me out there a little bit. Um, Sue Steenstrup, I know, is here. Uh, at the same table, and, and Mike Gorski, the regional engineer, I believe, uh, for Western Region, and they could, why don't you talk to them after the meeting and uh, explain what you know. Uh, Chris Horton, I live on East North Road, and uh, I remember when the original uh, consent decree was signed, there was a summary that was sent out by the EPA, and there was a single line in it that hit me like a ton of bricks. It said that the groundwater under the city of Pittsfield would be of no use to humans for the foreseeable future. Basically, the groundwater was a write-off in that agreement. I'm wondering if there are any, uh, if there's any groundwater component to this rest of the river part. Uh, and also, 
when you talk about the farmland, I'm wondering if there's any consideration to be uh, returning the farmland to productive use after the cleanup. Uh, your last comment first. Um, I don't, well, cleanup is going to be some number of years down the road probably, and I don't know what our plans are for the property, to be honest. I don't know that we would put it back into agricultural use, but I, I wouldn't rule it out completely. Um, the first part, point, I'm not sure what the fact sheet said from 10 years ago. I just don't recall um, about groundwater, although I don't believe anyone uses groundwater in the city of Pittsfield and Sol from a reservoir system, I believe. Originally, originally the city, I think what brought the whole PCD process on was the city of Pittsfield had a water shortage and they drilled, uh, they drilled the test wells out off East Street. And I think they found PCBs in those test wells because they were going to use groundwater to supplement the city of Pittsfield water supply. And I think that's what initiated this whole PCB process. And I know that there was only a single line given to it in that, well, it was a summary report, but it was only a single line. And it was shocking to me that nobody had ever considered damages uh, to, to be held accountable for lack of the use of all the groundwater under the city of Pittsfield, because I think they struck a huge aquifer out there in East. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that part. And under the Rusted River, though, there's been some groundwater sampling conducted in the past that didn't find any PCBs in the floodplain. And typically on these types of aquatic PCB type sites, you don't normally see that. So um, we're not specifically addressing that in this area. Anybody else? Uh, my name is Mike Ward. I'm with the Pittsfield City Council. It's off. It's off, Mike. Smart idea. Mike Ward, Pittsfield City Council. I just uh, have a question. I'm not sure who to direct this one to, but uh, getting back to the health risk segment that we covered very early on, it's my understanding that you know the, the typical health risks to humans uh, revolve around eating fish and uh, in, uh, intensive activity, you know, exposure to mud in, directly in the area of the river. What I'm interested in is what is the increased short-term risk or, or risk uh, due to volatilization uh, during remediation for the 10 or 15 year period for someone who lives a couple hundred yards away from the river that would not be eating fish or not rolling around in the mud. What is their increased risk uh, during the remediation? Um, well, I can give a little bit of perspective on that. I mean, we've done, I think we talked about earlier, the half mile remediation, which is about a three year project EPA did a four plus year project. Uh, so the first two miles, as we've said before, took about seven years. There was regular ongoing air monitoring associated with that. At least every month there was samples taken um, upwind, downwind in various areas around the excavation area, including, as you may recall, in the half mile, we ran into some uh, PCB oil that was very high concentration, higher than I think we'd likely see in Rester River. And the air monitoring data did not show we never got a detection above anything that the EPA would consider a risk um, in terms of monitoring the construction. I mean, if you, I mean, this is sort of, in, in areas where you do dry excavation, the sediment's usually damp and somewhat wet, and that really reduces any, I mean, PCBs don't volatilize much anyways, but the damp nature of the work and the excavation, um, we don't see PCBs really entering the air from that kind of pathway. And in terms of dust, uh, most of these projects, or maybe even all the projects, there's a real-time dust monitoring in case there's like airborne dust kind of emissions um, from dust being picked up by the wind. Uh, there's typically real-time dust monitoring going on around the vicinity of the work uh, with, a, with a fairly strict standard that if it ever did get exceeded, there would be uh, steps taken to reduce it and make sure that it was not a problem. Okay, I have three more questions at the table here, and we may... I have a question, not as the director of the Houstonic River Initiative, but as a property owner that has PCBs on my property. Cleanup plan, can I 
is telling me my PCBs will never be cleaned up. I have a piece of paper from EPA that says my land is contaminated. If I sell my piece of land, I have to tell the person who's buying that piece of land that there are PCBs on my property that I didn't put there, you guys put it there. And your plan stops a good two miles short of my house and my neighbor's house, which have PCBs on our land. And we may never see them get cleaned up because I know EPA likes to use this recreational scenario. My PCBs are not near my steps, but they're down a little from my house. And I'm extremely concerned that a lot of us homeowners who have contamination on our properties are going to be left holding the bag, GD's packing the station wagon, getting ready to move out of town, and forever I'm going to have that piece of paper that says you contaminated my land and I can do nothing about it. And it outrages me and it outrages my neighbors. And I hope that the EPA will consider doing something for us folks who have PCBs on our land and we're going to be stuck with them down there because we're a recreational scenario. It's outrageous that you allow a corporation to pollute our properties and it looks like nothing is going to be done. Or left. No accountability. I am Ben Friedman. <clears throat> I am uh, struck by the fact that we're in a school situation here. And I thought, well, what if I take the uh, step of actually pretending that I was a teacher tonight and I was grading GE? And I thought, there's a great deal of intelligence in this room at the table, a great deal of resources, um, and probably a great deal of creativity. And I realized that the problem, I think, the, the larger problem, is that the assignment was the wrong assignment. Because GE gets an A grade for presentation. It was absolutely flawless and slick and convincing and full of wonderful charts. But certainly if the task was to fulfill the dream of echo imagination and bringing good things to life, it would be closer to an F. Um, I, I think that we have to abandon the idea that PCBs are a color on a chart. We have to give up on the notion that a computer game can actually be applied with any legitimacy or real lives and to a real solution. What is required here is actually human intervention. What GE should have been asked to do, I wonder what the presentation would have looked like if GE was a potential contractor bidding for the best possible cleanup. What would the presentation look like if GE's task was to convince us that they could remove and destroy as many PCBs as possible and be as protective of the human and health and human and environmental health and safety as possible. It would be a very different presentation and I'm sure these gentlemen would have been up to the task. And that's the presentation that I would have liked to have seen tonight. So, I've accepted the fact that GE is not voluntarily going to take on this task, and therefore, at this point, we in Berkshire County are left looking to the EPA to fulfill their mission. Not only to be the Environmental Protection Agency, but the Protection Agency of Berkshire County and the protection agency of this river. And I hope that in the short period of time left, we're at probably 11.45 in the 12 hour clock here, um, that EPA will apply all of its intelligence and creativity and ability and experience to come up with 
solutions that really do involve the human intervention, assessing vernal pool by vernal pool. Can we, in fact, destroy this one? Sac destroy is probably a terrible word, but sacrifice it for the greater good. Is this the one that needs to be kept? So that not every vernal pool receives the identical six inches of sand or two inches of earth removal, but in fact, there are places where the damage to the natural resources are sufficiently high that we say, okay, this area we leave alone, that area we remediate. Get a round table of experts representing various components of the federal government, NOAA and, and others, even though they're not given ultimate jurisdiction here, and let the local people who know some of these areas weigh in on it. Let the Nature Conservancy weigh in on it, and really come up with a creative plan. Um, GE said, well, it would be stupid to start down at the bottom of Woods Pond at the same time we start at the top, because it would just be recontaminated. Well, what if a little creative thinking produced the concept that perhaps if you thought of Woods Pond as being a catch basin, and you emptied that catch basin out now and treated the sediment, and assumed that some of the areas that were too precious and too fragile to dig up now were simply allowed to be washed over by the river on an occasional basis, and that the Woods Pond would then again act as a catch basin for certain PCB and be treated in another 10 years, retreated. Just an idea. What if you approach the project that is being given to us in its you know, fullest dimension as a project that would take 50 years, and you said, okay, you're gonna do 10 years worth of work. And in 10 years, we're gonna look at all of the new technologies that have been developed in the intervening 10 years. And we're going to reassess, since you're going to be working on this for 50 years, we're going to reassess whether, in fact, the next 40 years are going to look the same as the past 10 years. Whether, in fact, there might be something better, more comprehensive, cheaper, less invasive than what you were thinking about 10 years ago and what we approved of 10 years ago. What if that decision had, was reached? I know it's, it's sort of messy. It involves people remaining on the job for a longer period of time than they, in fact, might have wanted to. It involves people reconvening. It involves people um, actually collaborating in a way that maybe they haven't. So I'm just asking and hoping that EPA, in its potential great wisdom, is not influenced by current politics, expediency, or precedent, and really fulfills the slogan of GE in terms of echo imagination that GE has failed to come up with and live for it tonight. Thank you. It's always hard to follow Benno. <laughs> My name is Judy Herkmer. My name is Judy Herkmer. I'm from Cornwall Ridge, Connecticut. I represent the Housatonic Environmental Action League. We're a grassroots organization. We've been coming up here for 13 or 14 years now. Our group was formed because we didn't think that enough attention was being paid to the PCB issues in Connecticut. And after doing some investigative research, we found out that the beloved environmental group in Connecticut that everyone counted on for their environmental needs was taking hundreds of thousands of dollars from General Electric and continues to this day. So um, we created our own group and we have been diligent in coming up here to support you because Connecticut was wiped off the consent decree map a long time ago. During the administration of John Rowland, when the negotiations were taking place, 
a paltry 7.75 million NRD natural resource damages fund was all it took for the state of Connecticut to back off. And now, with the corrective measures study, we lost EPA because they've signed off on monitored natural recovery for all of Connecticut. We're not as contaminated as you are up here. That's a good thing. But we do have major dams and major amounts, well, untold amounts, of contaminated sediment behind those dams. We have floodplain that hasn't even been characterized. We have duck that has never been tested. You have duck up here that was tested to found and found to have the highest levels of PCBs ever found in living tissue. And when we asked in Connecticut, were the duck going to be tested, we were told that the duck in Massachusetts stay up there. They don't come down to Connecticut. <laughs> we were told that last night that the fish, the contaminated fish in Massachusetts, respect the state boundary line. I'm fortunate to live on an 800-acre wildlife and forestry preserve started by my husband's grandfather at the turn of the century. We caretake headwaters that drain into the Housatonic River. I resent our clean, clear, Class A drinking water flowing into the Housatonic River and considered by General Electric to be contributing to monitored natural recovery. The solution to the pollution is not dilution. I wrote to Andy Silver yesterday. I emailed him because, yes, I sat through this presentation twice, once last night in Connecticut and tonight up here, to thank him for the presentation in Connecticut. We may um, disagree, but we're very fond of Andy. And I wrote him and said, I had an idea, and it's the same idea that many people in this room have had tonight. I said, Andy, what do you think if GE makes the Housatonic River site a model, a fantastic model for alternative technologies and PCB destruction technology? And then the companies that come in that are contracted to destroy the PCBs, General Electric could buy up all of those companies. Um, GE stockholders would be quite pleased with that windfall, and the bean counters at GE would be okay with it too. And their eco-imagination campaign would live in our backyard. There's two people in this room, across the room from GE. There's Mike, Mr. Mike Carroll, who's the GE manager for this site. And there is a very high level general electric attorney in the room also, who is with us frequently. Those are the people that have the power to walk back to Fairfield, Connecticut with what we say tonight. It's possible. The technology is out there. It exists. Some of it's expensive, some of it's high-tech, some of it's not so high-tech. And it works. It's working throughout the world. I, want, I actually want to thank GE for their presentation tonight because it filled the room. And there's a lot of new faces here. And this is a good thing because there's, there's more people now who, who get it and who will continue coming to these meetings and saying, no, we don't, we don't like that idea. We want the PCBs destroyed. We don't want them dug out and put in the upland backyard to drain back down into the watershed because every landfill leaks. The agency people have a hard time of it. They're under a lot of pressure. And they are our allies. 
We fight with them, uh, and they fight with us all the time. But they're the good guys, and uh, they're our, our only hope. So when you write comments, say that if GE doesn't take over and do the right thing by PCB destruction in the watershed, that you want EPA to take over and do the job for them. And then the citizens at least have an opportunity to work with their, their own federal agency or their legislators. Thanks to the legislator, by the way, who uh, came tonight. That's, that's an unusual occurrence. Um, that's it. Thanks so much. And, uh, and thanks to Suzanne also, who facilitates these uh, outrageous meetings. This was a very thoughtful meeting. I appreciate everybody's patience and contributions. We will adjourn the meeting. Please take any mess you brought with you home so that back custodians out, don't have to deal with it. Back in, back out. Yeah. No, take your big footprints. Don't